This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. Okay, I declare the meeting open and just um, to make everyone aware that we have everyone in the room other than, um, do we haven't everyone in the room this one? Uh, we have Fran McCann in the room, Sinead Innes, the Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong and Johnny Buckley. And dialing in today we have Andy Allen. Um, so I'll move on then to item agenda one, which is apologies. Have we received any apologies? I don't think I did either. There, see Mark Durkin is now on Starleaf as well, so welcome Mark as well. Um, then we'll move on to agenda item two, which is chairperson's business. Um, just, I just wanted to mention something. It's not really chairperson's business. Um, I did bring it up during the, the budget debate on Tuesday under my own comments, and that was the, the VRS system, the video re re replay service um, for those that are hard of hearing or, or, or that are speech impaired. Um, I, we had got a letter back from the department back on the 8th of October um, to say that that was being rolled out. Um, I've had further meetings, albeit it was to do with constituency matters, um, with members of the deaf community. It wasn't anything to do with this committee um, about how they, they, they find that it isn't working. It's just not working for them. So I was just to ask members, I know we're getting a briefing, um, and I know research are doing a briefing for us on the whole Sign Language Act, which is due to come um, all being well, hopefully, end of November, beginning of December, in front of the committee. But I just want to ask the committee, would they be of of the mind that I would, I mean, my opinion, I think we need to get the department certainly in to talk about the VRS and how they're rolling that out, um, especially within the Department of Communities, and then maybe get some people in from the deaf community to ask how it's actually working for them. Um, I don't know if members would agree with that, Fra. Sure, I think it's an excellent idea. Uh, I think was sometimes uh, that able bodied people uh, forget how difficult it is for others out there. And, I'm the, the vice chair of the uh, the, the, the committee that deals with blind people, partially said thing, partially impaired, and uh, it may not be a bad idea if they were invited in also, yeah. because they're, they're, they've had some particular difficulties, uh, and things, so they could be better than. Yeah, I just know even through our own constituency offices, I, I'm fortunate that I have a guy in my office that can't sign. Um, so, but I know from other MLAs I've spoken to, who they maybe have constituents with hearing or speech difficulties, and they've had to employ um, or had to employ the services of a, of a signer for their meetings. And I mean that's a cost uh, to we have to pay eighty pound for each of those sessions, which has to come out of our, our alliance, you know, our office cost allowance. So it does. Um, so I mean there should be a better system in place, certainly um, for these people. So yep, Kelly. I was just going to say, um, legislation is due to change shortly, um, and it will affect ourselves here, where um, captioning should be at the bottom of screens. So it would be interesting to see from the department how far on they are. My issue with it is, I think that all departments are playing the same game on this one, that they're all waiting for somebody else to procure the services, probably through finance, um, and then they'll use that one. The, the VRS system, I know that there are a group in Northern Ireland who are pushing for a better system. Um, the procurement of it is interesting, and I don't know whether communities will be over the detail of that end of it. Um, I'm very concerned because it is presumed that it's all deaf community. It's not. There are plenty of people, especially now with the massive increase we're going to have of people entering universal credit. Um, it's people like myself who lip read, who are not deaf with a large D, it's deaf with a small D. The number of people who just don't are not able to do the whole online system and um, that need a face to see. So it's it's disappointing that the deaf community are saying that, that, that it's not working for them. Um, a question I would love us to ask the communities is there's a disability, an internal disability um, strat or strategy or disability um, review that departments do, but it's always internal facing. It's never to do with customer facing. It would be lovely to see what they're doing to engage with the deaf community to, to, to find out what the problems are. Because there's no point in saying internally with staff, we'll get it sorted out. It's who they're dealing with, with the public. Sure, just just saying on that, I know that Carl, uh, from she sat on this committee recently and before, has quite an interest in, uh, in the, the, the bringing legislation forward for the deaf community. 
and I think she's keen to get that done as quickly I mean, I as remember possible. going back as far as even 2012, going to to her then when she was Minister of Culture, Arts and Leisure, and um, had the issue to do with, with parents of, of children that are born deaf and, and the funding that they required, and she so straight away was absolutely, they, they need that, and was more than... So I know, she, I know this is something that interests her, and I know it's something she wants to pursue. So members of agreement with that then, that we yep. uh, bring along the department, and then maybe, as Fra said... Um, the members from that APG uh, or even other members and it would be interesting also to hear uh, about, I know in Scotland um, they have a, a, an excellent service where theirs is not just for the public sector, it's for the private sector yep. uh, and all sectors actually um, that theirs is used for so it might be interesting even to hear from them uh, we can do that via Starlink or whatever uh, as to how their system works so members are okay with that, I know it's just added yep. something maybe into your work room but I think it's something that we need to act on sooner rather than later. Yeah, okay? Yep. All right. Um, I'll just, I don't see any hands up. Andy, have you any comment that you wanted to make on that? No, Paula, I'll be happy to take forward my important matter. Okay, thanks, Andy. Then we'll move on then to, I have no other business to share with you, members. Um, I'll move on then to agenda item three, which is the draft minutes. You'll find our the last week's draft minutes of the 15th of October 2020 at page six of your medium pack. Can I ask members, are you content or any issues you want to bring up from the draft minutes? No, all content. Andy, are you content? Yeah, content, sure. Thank you. Then we'll move to agenda item four, which is matters arising. Members, you've been provided a page 13 with a second sure. written update. Sorry, sure. Johnny. Just sorry, I was looking back on the minutes. Okay. Um, it's just a, a point of clarity because I know my star leaf did cut out. So I don't know whether that should be recorded as a present or a absent or an apology. I'm not sure because it cut out quite early. I've been having issues with Starleaf down in my constituency office. So just wanted to put that on record. I'm not sure what way that should be reflected in the minutes, but it's just important that I say it. Okay, that's fair enough. I'm yeah. sure there's something. I think if, if you were on Starleaf... Okay. You're counted yeah, as you're present. Yeah. Yeah. If I call out them, no problem. No, nope, that's okay. Because generally on the minutes, I mean, if any of us leave this room or anything, it will mm -hmm. be logged on the minutes that we left the room and the time we left, and then when we come back in again. So, um, but you're still marked down as present. All right, members. Okay, well then we'll move on then to where was I? Uh, agenda item four. So again, as I say, members, you've been provided page thirteen with a second written update on the remaining areas of committee interest. The minister covered a range of issues in her briefing at the meeting of the thirtieth of September. Um, so uh, you'll find all of those issues there and the department has also provided a forward work programme and can I inform members that the department have been asked for a date for the minister to come before committee again and have advised that the date will be set after recess and we know that the minister is self-isolating so we couldn't have expected her to come in front of committee during that period anyway. Um, so any comments or queries Kelly? Yes, um, I'm a, a little bit concerned about the job start scheme. Um, I know through communication with the Minister that additional money has not been allocated to her, although we haven't seen the monitoring round detail as yet. Um, it's due to start in November um, and we'd, we're not seeing any detail on it. I just was wondering, um, I'm sort of not expecting it to start before the end of this current lockdown period, but it would be good to know exactly what is going on with it. Um, we were due to have updates, and I appreciate that the Minister has been trying to drive this forward, and we get good updates from the Minister when there's anything to tell us, but that job start scheme is having me concerned. Um, of course, I'd, I'd, I'd put the, in the budget um, discussions, I did put the case forward that anybody that unspent money, it needs to go into schemes like this um, for the scarred youth. But I'm just concerned what's happening within the department. I think as a committee, it would be useful for us to see the detail of, of how this is going to work. And I know while some is mentioned there, I don't know any employers that have received information to even prepare to apply. No, I think that's a very, very valid point that you've made. I think we need to have the department then come in uh, as early as we can after we get back yeah. after yeah. recess um, to give us a full explanation on that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, I mean, I, I, I absolutely get this committee has a massive, huge, huge remit and there are some things that um, we have to discuss and have to go through and there are others that fall through the net and we wouldn't want this one falling through because it is a really worthwhile um, scheme. So, yeah, I think that would be an idea on that. Is this to do with... The yeah, no, it's on another topic on okay, the, go ahead. For the bids. Thanks, Chair. Um, just know, I, I see there on the, the further bids in relation to something like the boiler replacement scheme, etc., that, that's down there. You know, any of us that deal with 
the elderly constituents in particular will know how important these type of grant structures to insulate their homes, etc., during winter months in particular is so important. Mm. My concern, and maybe members have picked this up as well, you know, when you accumulate uh, the in total income of some pensioners that live in our constituencies that are actually living in, in homes that aren't fit for purpose, their social security benefits and pensions tick them just above the threshold, meaning that they're knocked out of the system. And I, I, th I feel that's unfair, and I think maybe the committee could maybe write to the department to ask. And in some cases, this is just knocked out by maybe a thousand pound, if even, that there should be some degree of flexibility within that system to allow for those elderly, vulnerable citizens that, as we come to the winter months, we, we know, even with COVID, there's going to be even more isolation in those communities, in particular rural communities, that we could maybe be seen to looking at the threshold, opening that up in some regard to allow those people that are just above that to enter the scheme because it will have such an impact. Yeah, and I suppose that's your whole issue around a lot of older people that are asset rich. Yeah. Um, and though financially they're not and it causes them it does knock people out of the scheme if you've got an occupational pension of any kind it's a small one because it, i suppose maybe sometimes it doesn't even come down to asset it's more driven on income and and those benefits place them just above that income threshold <coughs> okay look that's okay then we will write to the minister just maybe we just need to actually write just to refresh ourselves what the um, income bans are on that um, so we'll get that information first and foremost and then after that we can look and see what we want to do so any uh, that was actually we were discussing you've moved away ahead of me here Sorry. so that was to do with the, the the minister and her response so as i say said to you is um we know that she is self-isolating and we wish her well and we look forward to her being able to come back in with us um, but we will continue with that because I know it's important <coughs> that she comes back in front of the committee. So members happy with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then I'll move on then to page 20, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. a departmental update on the application process for funding for the arts sector. Um, I suppose, I, before I ask any comment or, or, or members to note this, um, I suppose it, it's just a little bit disappointing that it's still in the process, that stage of um, putting uh, the whole scheme together for part of it. Um, so I, I would hope that that money would have been rolled out a bit quicker. I know some has been rolled out, uh, it certainly has, but um, it's just that we need to keep uh, on top of that as to what that scheme is going to look like. So members, any other comments on that at page 20? No, happy enough. Then we'll move on to page 21, yep. uh, which is the capital bids, which some of you have already discussed. Um, anybody else want to mention anything to do with the capital bids? No, that's okay. Then can I move you on then to page 28, and that's a departmental reply to the committee queries on the Northern Ireland Housing Executive Investment Challenge. Again, any comment or query or content to note that too? Yeah. Yep, happy days. Move then on to page 35 with the departmental briefing paper on the main estimates. Again, I'm going to ask any comment or query on that? No. Okay, Andy, I'm going to go to you on the phone again. Um, out of all of those of you, any comment or query? Or are you content to note? Um, more or less content to note, sir, just uh, the capital bids one, um, just to reiterate the, the sub-regional stuff, um, obviously uh, it's indicating uh, not to come online, so uh, after the, the, this current mandate, it's just obviously to get a, a briefing from the department in respect to that as quickly as we possibly can, because that will be 11 years on since the original commitment was be made by the executive. Okay, we'll do that. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Okay, members, we're going to then move on to agenda item five, which is the Irish Football Association briefing on the impact of COVID-19 on local football. Members, you'll find this agenda item at page 39 of your meeting packs. Uh, can I then welcome to the meeting Patrick Nelson and David Martin. So Patrick is chief executive and David is the president. And I'm going to go straight to you guys and um, ask if you could brief the committee, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, the, the welcome. We're delighted to be uh, joining with you this morning uh, by way of invitation. Uh, we work very closely with uh, the various government, government departments as an organisation. This is a great opportunity to, to, to speak with you. We have uh, received briefing uh, documentation and, and responded to that, and, and we're very open to and, and fine to answer any questions that you, the committee may wish to have uh, concerning those notes. Okay, um, so just go straight into questions then. 
Yep, okay, we've got a few members. I'm going to open it up first, and I've got Kelly, then I've got Johnny, and I've a few of myself. So, Kelly, do you want to go first? Yes, thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, just reading through your paper, I, I appreciate there's going to be issues that we'll, we'll all want to talk about um, with regards to the COVID situation of finances, but just to start off by congratulating Northern Ireland on reaching the Euro playoff final wish them well of course for a victory and, and qualification for the tournament but um, one of the things I would like I have a few questions here so would you prefer me to give you them all together or yeah and then let you go through them yeah um, your, your choice Kelly <laughs> whatever, you, whatever you think um, works best for you I'll start off with that um, the Euro playoff final so how important will it be for fan attendance at the National Stadium Windsor Park um, for the Euro playoff, which is planned for um, Slovakia on the 12th of November, which is the day before the end of our current lockdown period. Um, what discussions have you had with the department with regards to that match? And um, if, if fans are allowed in, um, what assurances can you give fans about the, the possible um, virus and, and COVID protections? Um, I, I know you've brought it up within your paper about the sub-regional facilities program. Um, just to get a catch up from you about that and what discussions you've had. If if the money was available now, how would you guys allocate that? Um, what would be the process that you would prefer to see happen with that? Um, and obviously, if you have any idea of when the allocations are going to happen, I'd see in some of our papers there's talk of an update in December. Um, the other thing I want to ask you about, are you in any talks with any clubs regarding a partnership um, on, for a regional training centre? And Thinking about you know that training, what impact does this current lockdown have on youth services and their training? And is it safe for them to train at the moment? Um, I think I'll leave it there because I'm sure there'll be others will have lots of questions. Okay, um, Kelly, thank you for that, and I, I will try. Uh, I'll try and answer the questions as uh, as well as I can. But you know, please come back to me uh, if uh, if I miss out on any of them. I've, I've tried to scribble down um, the, the key questions there. Um, firstly, you know, thanks for the warm wishes with regard to the um, the match with Slovakia on the uh, 12th of uh, November uh, here in Belfast. Um, President and myself were uh, were fortunate enough to be in Sarajevo a couple of weeks ago uh, to see us uh, win the semi-final. Obviously, it was quite uh, quite nerve-wracking in the end, as it comes down to uh, a penalty shootout, and uh, and it was great that um, you know, Liam Boyce, in particular, was able to step up and uh, put the ball in the back of the net and um, allow us to uh, have the opportunity to dare to dream again in terms of going to the Euros. Um, you know, the Euros is one of the biggest football tournaments um, that you can find. It's certainly one of the biggest sporting tournaments in the world, and. Uh, uh, we, we lit it up last time with both our, our, our play and our fans, and we want to be there again. So uh, fabulous that we've got an opportunity on the 12th of November. Um, we would hope to have some spectators in the ground, the National Football Stadium at Windsor Park for that game. Um, uh, of course, as long as the regulations allow us to do that. Um, we've had, we, we've actually led the way, I think, in terms of the whole of the United Kingdom over the last few months in terms of bringing spectators back on a safe basis into uh, the ground. We do uh, temperature checking. Uh, we've got lots of uh, hand sanitization options. Uh, we make frequent um, announcements throughout the game to remind people about social distancing and uh, and the the, you know, the government's hands, face, space messaging. And in addition to that, we, uh, we specifically indicate where, um, where people should sit. And uh, I think members of the committee will be aware that we have, uh, uh, I think it's 18,534 seats here at the National Football Stadium. And um, we work hard along with our stadium manifest and our ticket provider uh, to work out which seats can be used and which seats can't be used when we're looking at the sort of numbers like 600 or 1,000 or whatever it is that, um, that we might be able to get in on that date. Um, we're obviously very aware that, um, that we're in a, a four-week circuit breaker period, if that's the, if that's the current terminology, uh, and, uh, and we're, we're appreciative of, of all the efforts that have been made through society to... Um, 
stop the or stop or prevent the community transmission of COVID-19. Uh, we are committed to doing whatever we can to help that. Uh, but we believe at the moment that we can provide a, a safe environment for um, uh, for supporters to attend that game. Uh, but of course, we will uh, will abide by the regulations. I think Kelly, you asked, are, are we speaking specifically to the department about the about the game? Um, not not really. I don't think um, we're, we're more speaking to uh, Belfast City Council, um, and uh, and that would be members of my team who are doing that. Uh, because there is a safety advisory group for uh, for every regulated football ground, um, uh, sports grounds actually, sports grounds that are regulated under the safety of sports ground order from 2006. And uh, and the, the local council, so Belfast City Council in our case, is the one who has the, uh, has the, they're the relevant authority, if you like. And so we are dealing with them on the planning uh, for that game or for any other game. Uh, and equally, we know that our colleagues, uh, the Northern Ireland Football Club members, the clubs such as Cliftonville, Crusaders, Linfield, et cetera, et cetera, are, are all speaking to their relevant safety, uh, safety advisory groups as well. Um, I'll maybe stop at, stop at that before I move on to sub-regional just to check if, uh, Kelly, if there was anything that I didn't cover in that with regard to the game on the 12th. No, that's, that's great. Thank you very much, Ian. Okay, let me let me touch on the uh, on the uh, sub-regional then, uh, if I could. Um, th this um, th th this project has a long history, and I think you m members of the committee will be absolutely fully aware of that. Um, I think it was the 10th of March 2011 when um, Nelson McCausland, who was the then decal minister in the then decal department. Um, made the announcement in the first place of uh, the regional stadium funding for ourselves, for what turned out to be Kingspan, uh, and of course for for Casman, and um, and obviously two of those uh, two of those state uh, two of those stadia have been built, and um, and we look forward to you know well we have a we have a great relationship with our friends in the GAA, and uh, and we look forward to uh, Casman being built as well. Now, as part of that announcement, uh, Mr. McCausland also announced that there would be a sub-regional fund uh, for football. And, uh, and we're now nine and a half years on from that. And, and we appreciate that there's been lots of issues and lots of complexity in that meantime. But, um, but we, we are working closely with the Department of Communities at the moment in terms of how that, um, how that fund might look. Uh, and um, and what sort of priorities that we would have to uh, to utilise such a fund? Uh, the quantum of the fund is uh, is obviously an important thing. Um, originally, it was uh, it was suggested that it would be 36.2 million pounds back in March 2011. Um, I think um, I think you know many things have changed since then. Um, you know, not least the uh, you know the, the the inflation that's gone on around the world and uh, and on all sorts of construction projects. So I think um, I think you know we would be of the belief that uh, uh, that particular number needs to be looked at again, and we understand that there are going to be pressures around uh, capital commitments from the executive. But um, but you know it's our sincere belief that. Uh, uh, we could generate significant value for Northern Ireland with uh, with a higher number than 36.2 million. In terms of the priorities, and and I'll, I'll sort of touch partly on a on a on, on another question there, Kelly. Uh, the regional train, uh, the national training centre for us is w within this re uh, sub regional program is uh, probably our top priority. Um, you know, there there are many of the 55 nations of UEFA who have got uh, their own national training centers where they can, uh, they can look after both the men's and the women's teams all the way from the seniors right down to the under 16s and, and the people who are, are aspiring to be footballers. So the, the 14 and 15 year olds, et cetera. Um, we've never had that luxury. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're delighted that we do have the national football stadium now and, uh, and, and we credit the executive again for providing the bulk of the funding for that project and, and it's been a very successful project I think 
But our top priority within the sub-regional program would be to, uh, to try and develop a national training center. And we've looked at a couple of locations. Um, we, we wouldn't necessarily be looking at partnering with a club on that. We'd be, uh, at the moment, we've looked at a couple of locations that are not club related. Uh, but we hope that that project can come to fruition over time. Um, other priorities within the uh, sub-regional program, and we, we're, we're constantly looking at this to make sure that we're, we're, we're up to date and we're, you know, we're keeping with where Northern Ireland is as a country on this, um, are that um, we believe that there should be some investment in some of our larger football grounds. Uh, and by larger football grounds, I mean typically the ones that are in the Northern Ireland Football League. Uh, the clubs that are in that league. Um, there has been a, a distinct lack of investment in those grounds for whether you call it 30, 40 or 50 years. Um, the uh, Over on the mainland, if you like, in GB, uh, following the Hillsborough disaster in 1989, there was the Lord Justice Taylor report, uh, which recommended significant rebuilding of football grounds uh, in England in particular. And um, Significant amounts of money went into that. Uh, we're talking here about the 90s and the noughties, but um, that didn't happen here in Northern Ireland. So we're, we're behind the curve in that respect. And, and we believe that there is a strong case for uh, investment in the capital infrastructures of Northern Ireland Football League grounds. In addition to that, we have a really healthy pyramid of football with nearly a thousand teams playing on a regular basis. In the, uh, in the senior men's game, if you like, on a, on a Saturday afternoon, all the way through the winter from September through to May. And, uh, and those thousand teams play on a, a wide variety of grounds. Um, many of them are, are council pitches uh, and they're hired on a, on, a, on a daily basis, if you like. But many of the clubs as well have invested in their own grounds. Um, but Again, uh, that investment probably needs to be supplemented with, uh, with other funds and, and on a much more modest basis, I would say, than, uh, than the Northern Ireland Football League clubs, because we're talking about you know, grounds where there might be 100, 150 or 200 spectators on a Saturday. But these are community hubs as well. You know, they all play a massive part in their local community. And, and we'd like to think that through the sub-regional programme, we could assist those clubs. Um, so, Kelly, again, I'll, I'll perhaps pause there if, if I can and, um, and see if, if, you're, if, if, those, if I've answered your, your, your questions, other than the one about youth services, which I'll still come to. Um, I think at this stage that's fine. I'm sure others will maybe come in on that one. Yeah, I'm keen to hear about youth services. Yeah, yeah and this is, this is an area where, uh, at the moment, within the, uh, within the current circuit breaker, we have, um, we have asked... Um, all football apart from elite football, and we've determined that to be uh, the Danske Bank Premiership within the Northern Ireland Football League, uh, plus our international teams. Uh, but we've asked everyone else to, to pause for, for this four-week period. And, uh, you know, that, that does have an impact. Um, and we're, we're, we're sad about the impact that that has in terms of uh, people being out there and able to train and play on a regular basis. But we do understand that it's a necessary move at this point to uh, to help um, control the spread of uh, of coronavirus, and uh, and we've um, you know we've we've gone uh, we've gone to that level of, uh, of of removing training as an option. Now, I know technically um, people can train, and we've we've tried to clarify this. People can train uh, without a football in in small groups up to fifteen within the regulations. Um, but we've tried to do our part over the last few weeks and, uh, and, and, to, and to state that, um, you know, training and playing football at all levels below the Danske Bank Premiership is not something that should be done. And of course, we, we don't want that to be a, a long term issue. Uh, we will be hoping that um, uh, we're now almost one week into the four weeks. We would be hoping that um, at the end of the four week period, we can get back to some normality. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Just before I bring Johnny in, I just want to do a follow up on something that you'd said there. Um, you talked about with part of the sub regional stadia investment in larger football grounds and, and with some of those clubs. You will know that um, last week we had Niffle in 
um, to brief us, and they were very clear in telling us that some of some of the clubs within their league um, are at breaking point and are finding things extremely difficult, especially as the, the lack of, of the of the ticket sales. Um, I just wanted to ask you, you'd mentioned in your report something to do with the UEFA hat trick fund. Mm -hmm. um, just to ask, um, will any of that be distributed to any of those clubs to help them out in any way? Um, well, <laughs> Paula, thank, thank you for that. Let me let me just give you some context for the UEFA hat trick fund. It's um, It's a fund that has been uh, around since I think 2004 or thereabouts and um, it's a, a regular source of funding for all national football associations and it's built into our um, our budgets as part of our normal turnover within the Irish Football Association so um, we don't have the we don't have the freedom to reallocate that to clubs because uh, we're using it already we, we tend to turn over uh, depending on the number of games we have and the number of tickets that we can sell, and of course we, we can't sell very many tickets at the moment, but we would normally turn over between 18 and 20 million pounds within the Irish Football Association each year. And uh, we, we make a very modest surplus. We aim to make a very modest surplus because for that 18 to 20 million pounds, we spend it on football in Northern Ireland. Uh, and so... Uh, we don't really have the ability to reallocate the UEFA hat trick money. Um, what we have done is that um, we have uh, we've been given some extra funding by FIFA, the world governing body. Um, they allocated a uh, million dollars to us uh, in the summer as a uh, as an additional fund, which came from their own resources, from um, from their own uh, reserves, if you like. And, uh, and they've allocated a similar sum to every national association around the world. And our board looked at that sum in August and determined that 80% um, of it, so 800,000 uh, US dollars, I don't have the exact figure on my head in terms of, um, of how, how much that was in, in pound sterling, but, but a significant sum. And that has gone straight out to clubs. Uh, and we've done that on a tiered basis. So that the, um, the clubs that you would have been speaking to last week, for example, from the Northern Ireland Football League, uh, would have got the, the bigger share of that because we understand uh, the, the position they're in. Um, they, they would typically have, between the 12 clubs in the Premier League, they would typically have gate receipts in a normal season of about £2.1 million. And in the current season, clearly, that is going to be reduced considerably. And so the, the funding that we were able to give them from FIFA has, uh, has made a bit, of a, uh, a bit of a dint in that, I think, in terms of uh, improving the situation they're in. Um, they started their season last weekend with, as I mentioned before, the safety advisory groups have given safe capacities within the current regulations for every club. So they've started with limited crowds, and, um, and, and, and the, at the moment they will continue with those limited crowds. So um, we're also working with, um, uh, with the Minister for Communities. We had two good uh, meetings with her this week, by the way, and I know that um, she is trying to put together a package, uh, not just for football and not just for the Northern Ireland Football League, but for all of the sports in Northern Ireland who are suffering at this point uh, because they're not able to bring the income in. And, and we would fully support the Minister in, in her endeavours to, uh, uh, to generate some funding for um, for all sport uh, and for football in particular. And um, those 12 member clubs who, um, uh, well, 36 member clubs within within the Northern Ireland Football League, but 12 in particular in the uh, in the Danske Bank Premiership, where, where most of the financial commitments are, uh, we'll continue to work with them uh, as much as we can to try and help them through the, uh, the, the, the current issues. Thank you. I appreciate that answer. I just want to ask another follow-on just quickly from that. And you'd mentioned there again when we were talking about the stadia, about our local grassroots clubs. Um, and I know um, I, I sat in council for a number of years and I know the, the amount of ones that use council grounds and the amount of council funding that would have went into a lot of our, our, our local clubs. Um, I know the great work they do. Just two weeks ago, I was with Rathcool. Um, with the club there and their their young people, the, the teams they have for young people, it's it's uh, stopping antisocial behaviour, it's diverting young people into a different way of life and a healthier life 
healthier yeah. mentally as well as physically. They're doing such <coughs> great work. Um, so it's just to ask um, sort of what, uh, what involvement um, have you had with them over the, the recent months? Because I know they have put a lot of, a lot of um, things in place um, to protect um, the, their players, their coaches, uh, the, and the, the attendance at those matches is, is almost nil. <coughs> albeit they don't get a fight, they don't get, they don't financially benefit a lot of them from attendance. So it's just um, sort of what help have you been for them? Um, well, perhaps if I could mention that um, we we have a, um, a company within our group called the Irish FA Foundation, uh, which we we set up at the end of 2016, and uh, and we have a, a very wide range of, um, of community uh, interventions which take place through the foundation staff. Um, we've got probably about 70 staff within the foundation. And again, when I, when I talk about the 18 to 20 million pounds turnover that the, that the IFA uh, generates each year, um, it funds the foundation through that as well. So um, there's a, a very significant range of, um, of activities which, uh, which go on throughout the length and breadth of Northern Ireland with our staff who are in the foundation. Um, just looking, can we, can we, sorry, our, our lighting's gone off here. I'm just, there we go, we're, we're, back, to, we're, we're back to lighting. Apologies for that. Um, we, we have a very wide range of, uh, of activities. Um, we have, uh, uh, you know, back in the game, for example, for, for, for people who maybe are, um, uh, of more mature years and, and feel that, um, you know, maybe football is something they'd like to come back to as they get older. We, you know, we want, to, we want everybody to uh, enjoy the benefits of football. So back in the game is one of our programs. Ahead of the game is a, is a very important one as well, because that's where we, that's where we look at a lot of, uh, a lot of mental issues. Um, you know, we understand that um, football and sport in general can, uh, can help enormously in terms of people's, uh, uh, health and well-being from a, a mental perspective and ahead of the game is a is a, a significant program that we run within our foundation um, to to assist clubs all the way through northern ireland and communities all the way through northern ireland from that perspective and we just highlight highlight one more um we're, we're working hard on uh, with with the department of justice actually on a program called stay on side um which uh, which works Within the criminal justice uh, system, to uh, to look at people who either uh, maybe have offended or are at risk of offending, and uh, and it, it sort of um, gives them things like coaching qualifications and opportunities to to do coaching, so that um, you know they can uh, they can see the real benefits not only for themselves but for the communities they're in as well. So, a, a very significant proportion of our of our turnover goes into. Uh, community activities throughout Northern Ireland. Okay, look, thank you for that. That's me for now. I've got then of Johnny, then I'm going to go to Andy, then of Sinead, then of Mark, then of Frat. So, Johnny. Okay, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, gentlemen, for coming along this morning. And again, I would echo the comments of, of Kelly. I congratulate Northern Ireland football and uh, the golden age, which many of us have enjoyed. It's been a pleasure watching, and it's a pleasure seeing the development of the structure overall in relation to, to Windsor Park and, and the national team. Uh, I thank also for the work done by all uh, football clubs across Northern Ireland in relation to uh, the community response to COVID-19. Football alongside GAA and indeed uh, Ulster Rugby and all other sports have played a crucial part in, in supporting their communities throughout COVID-19. Um, you mentioned there to the Chair in your remarks, and it's something I was going to touch on, the importance of ticket sales to both not only the IFA and indeed the National Stadium, but also to uh, Northern Ireland Football League clubs. We know the worry and financial situation that's out there. It, it, it's dire. It's hitting all sectors. But I have significant concerns as to the future viability of sporting clubs if relief is not found and found soon. I know the IFA and indeed the NIFL have, wor have had considerable work carried out with COVID response working groups in relation to the safe return of fans in a socially distant manner given the size and scale of many of their stadiums. Could you maybe outline in, in detail to the committee the work that has went on in terms of uh, facilitating that safe return of albeit a limited number of supporters to grounds? Okay, um, Johnny, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll have a go at that, but um, you, you maybe appreciate that um, 
uh, you know, I, I'm not from a club myself, so so I won't necessarily know the the full detail of what's gone on in every club. Um, but you're absolutely right that uh, we've been in a golden age since um, since I think it's the 7th of September 2014 was the beginning of the current golden age, when we we played our first Euro 2016 qualifier in uh, in Budapest, uh, and, and we won that one. And uh, and and Johnny, if I've if I've got your uh, if I've got your location correct, it was a it was a Mid Ulster man, um, Niall McGinn, who scored one of the goals on on that night. So um, so you know that golden age began with uh, uh, with Niall, and uh, it continued with Niall, who scored the equaling goal in Sarajevo. So um, so let's hope the golden age continues. Back to ticket sales, though. Um, yes, this is uh, this is perhaps one of our most significant issues at the moment because. Um, uh, as you'll see in the briefing uh, that we provided to the committee, um, ourselves uh, at, uh, at the IFA are, are down by um, something in the order of two and a half million pounds this year, uh, based on the fact that we're, ha we're playing games in this stadium that uh, the president and I are sitting in at the moment, and, and we're playing them with uh, almost no spectators. We had 600 people in for the uh, for the Austria game recently. We had 500 people for the Irish Cup final back at the end of July, uh, and, and we appreciate that it's uh, it really isn't the time to have um, full stadia at this point, or even anything approaching full stadia. But um, the the clubs, uh, so Linfield, for example, here in the in the National Football Stadium at Windsor Park. Uh, Glen Torren at the Oval and every other team in the in the Premiership has worked really in detail with ourselves, um, and we have issued the return to training and return to play protocols that um, that they're all abiding by, uh, and they've worked with those safety advisory groups at the councils as well to determine precisely what the the councils, as the lead, and, and the clubs uh, think is the right safe capacity for this current moment. And I think, if I'm correct, that they're all in the area of about 15% of what the normal safe capacity would be. And I think you'll appreciate that um, we typically don't have full stadia within Northern Ireland, um, but you know our clubs will be uh, will be hurting enormously at 15% of capacity, uh, and that's why it, it is really important that. The, the request that, uh, that uh, Karen Cullen, as the Minister for Communities, is, is putting together, I think, for the executive to try and provide a rescue package for sport, given that we, we can't generate the income that we normally would generate, is such an important thing for the, uh, for the safety and security of our clubs. And what we need to remember as well is those clubs are businesses. You know, they, they employ quite a considerable number of people um, within this country. They're probably, you know, if you take the 12 Danske Bank Premiership clubs together, uh, they would be the most significant employer within sport within our country. And their, um, their ability to generate revenue is severely curtailed at the moment. So the sooner that we can uh, come together with a, with a package of support for them, I think the better. Absolutely, absolutely agree with that, and I know maybe uh, you might be modest in saying it in relation to the, the engagement with COVID response working groups. But I know personally the grave, de detailed work that has went on with individual clubs uh, to adhere to to regulation and indeed adhere to safe uh, spectator crowd sizes uh, to allow for a safe return to help offset the difficulties that arise by the lack of ticket sales. And that's why I have to say I was extremely disappointed by the 11th hour intervention by the Minister in relation to uh, safe return of spectators to uh, football clubs on the mouth of the Irish League season. Uh, I, I'm glad that did resolve itself in some way, but I know that you met with the Minister. Did you place on record the concern of not only the IFA, but indeed I'm sure you've been in conversations with representative clubs as to their concern regarding that, uh, that situation. We talk about the financial package that's needed. Absolutely, you will not hear a, a doubt in this committee. We advocate, we've advocated it here for weeks. We need a strong financial package to rescue our sport clubs, not just football, but indeed right across the sector. 
uh, livelihoods depend upon it, but indeed the future viability of sport within communities uh, stands at the brink, it stands at the edge now, uh, and we must as government step up, and I would urge the Minister to come forward with a financial package as quickly as possible. But could you maybe outline that response and that engagement with the Minister following that confusion regarding uh, access to sport grounds? Well, Johnny, I think it's um, it's always regrettable when when there is confusion. Um, but what I would say is uh, uh, we have a great relationship with uh, with, with Carol Cullen. Um, you know, I've known Carol since she was first appointed as uh, as the then decal minister in um, uh, in I think it was May 2011 or thereabouts. Uh, she's very it's very direct, very forthright. Um, uh, we, we are the same. Um, we, we are direct and forthright as well. Uh, we, we've had some good conversations with her over the last uh, the last few days, uh, and we fully back her um, her move to to go to the executive and uh, and create a, a funding rescue package for all of sport and uh, and obviously for ourselves for football. Well, we would certainly support that, and, and hopefully that can come as quickly as possible to address the need. In closing, chair, I just want to address an issue which I know is uh, has been raised with me, and it is in particular reference to Mid Ulster. Uh, it is technical, so I'd ask you to bear with me on it. But it's about governance issues and around the code of conduct and code of ethics. In the correspondence, Mr. Nelson, uh, to the committee on the 20th of July, you state that on the 27th of June 2019, the IFA board instigated a code of conduct and agreed. Code of ethics applicable to the IFA board, members of the IFA council and all association committees. A circular dated 29th of July 2019 was sent from, the I from, the, from FIFA to all their members' associations and the newly adopted 2019 version of the Code of Ethics for the attention of the IFA and their members' clubs and thanking you for ensuring uh, that your affiliated clubs were informed accordingly. The circular also stated, please do not hesitate to contact us should you have any questions in this regard. Could I ask the IFA uh, why they did not carry out this instruction from FIFA, which meant that uh, a consul, uh, and then without a consultation, send out the 8th, on the 8th of August their own codes to members to sign in return? This has caused a lot of confusion among particularly members in my, my own Mid Ulster Association. Uh, well, uh, Johnny, you're right. It's a complicated issue. Uh, uh, although, uh, to a certain extent, um, we, we've done our best to try and simplify it. Um, you, you have identified there that there's, uh, that there's perhaps um, a concern from uh, from a number of council uh, nominees from from the Middlesbrough area. But what I would say is that um, you know our code of ethics is. Uh, not at all incompatible with the with the FIFA code of ethics. So we think we've uh, we've complied uh, very well with, uh, with with FIFA's direction on that. Um, you know we're one of 211 members of FIFA, uh, and and we like to think that we're a well governed and well structured organisation uh, within that football family. Uh, and so uh, we think having a, a you know a good code of ethics and a good strong code of conduct is. Uh, it is absolutely vital uh, in, in terms of uh, ourselves as an organization. As I've, as I've said on a couple of occasions already, we turn over 18 to 20 million pounds of, uh, of funds each year. And so we want to be absolutely sure that we've got good governance around that. Uh, and we've got very strong governance with uh, a main board of directors uh, for the Irish Football Association, a subsidiary board for the for the stadium company uh, and a subsidiary board as well for the Irish FA Foundation that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we've got a really strong group audit and risk committee uh, chaired by one of our independent directors, uh, which which looks on a group basis at uh, all sorts of uh, risks on a, on a regular basis. Uh, we have uh, internal auditors and external auditors, uh, and we have a program of uh, uh, of risk management that uh, that is part of our governance structure. And the code of ethics and con a code of conduct is is just part of that. Um, we believe it's the right thing. We believe it's structured properly, and and to be honest, um, the vast majority of our council members would agree with that. Um, there are members from the middle area, Jonathan, who have signed the code of conduct and are part of our council at this very moment. Uh, there are a small number who have chosen not to sign the code of conduct. 
but the rest of our council members have signed it and um, we're in conversation uh, as, as you may well know um, with, uh, with, with those members who or those nominees who, who haven't signed yet and we hope we'll get a resolution. Okay, and thank you, and, and I hope that that resolution can be found. I, I, I know it's, it's worrying developments, and I'm not the only committee member that has concerns about this. And I would urge dialogue, the, the Mid Ulster Football Association in particular, as the second oldest and, and second, second largest affiliated division of the Association of the IFA, are now considerably underrepresented at all levels. And it's harmful to the organisation and reputation of association football in Northern Ireland. So I, I think we all have a responsibility and duty of care to others, especially their mental health and well-being in these difficult times. And, and I just want to leave it by saying I would urge the association to resolve this matter uh, as soon as possible for the benefit of all parties to endeavour to restore a good, uh, a good relationship within the game, which I'm sure we all want to see going forward. Jonathan, thank you for that. But I, I just reiterate that um, the, the vast majority of our council members through all of the constituencies in Northern Ireland have, have uh, happily signed the Code of Conduct. And in fact, some members from the Middle Ulster area have signed the Code of Conduct. So as I say, we, we, are, we are working with the, the nominees who haven't signed it uh, and we hope we'll get a resolution. Okay, I'll leave it there, Chair. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Johnny. I'm going to go and ask Andy now um, if there was a comment or um, question he wanted to ask. Thank you, Chair. Um, most of the points that I wanted to raise have been covered, but I, I will raise a, a couple of very brief points. David, Patrick, thank you for coming to the committee to, to brief us today. Uh, and can I just on record again? Uh, like other committee members have done. So congratulations to the team, the manager, and all involved with uh, Northern Ireland at this time and, and, and these golden days have, have been described. Uh, and I know, obviously, uh, there's been tremendous work going on right the way throughout the years and even before the golden days, as, as you outlined back in 2014 as they started with Now and Again. Uh, and, and please on record as well, uh, my gratitude and thanks to the amalgamation of Northern Ireland supporters clubs uh, who often do amazing and sterling work behind the scenes uh, right across the world. And, and as you pointed out, David, that has been rightly recognised also across across the world. Uh, just, just one point you'd mentioned, uh, and, and I'm not uh, labour on it uh, majorly, uh, the, the sterling work that has gone on right across the board uh, from grassroots level right up to uh, senior level in respect of the safe return of spectators to sport. And... Um, I think um, colleagues will have seen um, it described by you know quite uh, senior sporting stars right across uh, the UK that uh, sports fans, spectators are are the backbone of sport, and and they truly are. Uh, and we all want to see the safe return of fans, and that is an important point point the safe return. Uh, and if I might, and I appreciate if you're not in a position to to give any further detail on this, but do do you have a figure in mind as to what the safe capacity of the stadium uh, in terms of the, the game on the 12th of November? Um, Andy, I'd, li I'd like to say that's the $64,000 question in, in many ways. And I suppose if I, if I divided 64000 by our ticket price, that might, maybe that would come up to the answer. Um, I, think, um, I think the most appropriate answer I could give in reality is that it would be a fairly modest number. Uh, we had 500 people in for the uh, Irish Cup final on the 31st of July. Uh, we had 600 people in for the uh, UEFA Nations League game a couple of weeks ago against Austria. Uh, we, we believe that um, we could expand that number modestly uh, and appropriately um, uh, within the current regulations. Uh, but we will work with uh, with Belfast City Council to uh, to try and come up with uh, what we think is the right number. And and Andy, if I could just touch on one thing that you mentioned there, um, you, you mentioned the amalgamation of Northern Ireland supporters clubs, and uh, and I'd, I'd just like to uh, say from our perspective within the Irish Football Association, uh, we very much welcome our our relationship uh, with uh, the amalgamation there. And in particular, the office bearers in the amalgamation who we've worked with for a long time. And, uh, and if I can just touch on our governance again, um, several years ago, I can't remember exactly how many years, it's probably seven or eight, I would think, seven or eight, we, we actually, we, we created a place on our council for 
the amalgamation of Northern Ireland supporters. So they not not only are they are they the voice of supporters um, within uh, you know or for the Northern Ireland national team, uh, but they've also got uh, a, a concreted in place within our governance structures as well. And uh, and we're always delighted to work with them. Thanks very much. And, and if I may, um, just just uh, turn to the sub-regional stadia program. It, it's a topic that I have raised at the committee and, and in other forums quite regularly. Um, and and it's, a, it's a program that I like, would like to see delivered. I'm sure colleagues would support me in this uh, as quickly and as swiftly as possible. Uh, and I appreciate um, the questions that I've asked the minister that she, she feels that due to the, a change in the, the landscape, the football landscape, that um, the, the requirement for further consultation is required. Are, are, you, are you happy at this stage that the level of consultation and communication um, has perhaps been completed? Do you feel that the, the IFA have completed that journey with the department? Uh, and, and do you feel that uh, there, there's no further uh, discussion required at this stage to move forward? Well, Andy, one, one thing I would say is that um, when we go back to 2011 and 2012, there were there were different uh, different viewpoints and different papers floating around at the time. Uh, but we're <clears throat> we're either eight or nine years on from that, depending on you know which, which viewpoint you have. Um, a lot of things have moved on. Um, there have been different investments in uh, in, in football clubs. Uh, you know, uh, Larn Football Club, for example, has had a lot of uh, private investment. Uh, Glentoran Football Club has had a lot of private investment as well, and uh, and you know we we welcome uh, we welcome the you know the changes that uh, that those new owners have made and the thinking that they've uh, they've brought to football in Northern Ireland as well. Um, but I think um, we we would say that uh, as a national association and working with uh, with the Department for Communities that um, that probably you know th there is enough clarity I think. Uh, within within the association and hopefully within the Department for Communities, um, that we could go ahead with uh, with the sub regional strategy now, if the funding was agreed, uh, with with, uh, with fairly solid and agreed priorities. So we wouldn't suggest that uh, any further detailed consultation will be needed at this point. There might be a little bit around the edges, uh, but we think uh, you know the basics are pretty much done if that makes sense no no absolutely and thank you for that it's very very, very helpful and uh, it's a program that we want to see rolled out as, as quickly as possible given that it has been a commitment uh dating back to 2011 and it's a it's very much a, a funding stream that many within the wider uh football fraternity need need now and, and as quickly and as swiftly as possible just, just one final point chair uh and there was reference obviously to the minister bringing forward a package of support uh, a rescue package perhaps uh and, and that would be a package that would be very much welcome um to to support the wider sports sector right across northern Ireland, a sector that, that, that uh, provides so much in, in terms of employment but but even beyond that so much within each of our communities within each of our constituencies and i think uh if we as a committee chair could uh, seek further clarification from the minister on that, and, and the details also. And I'm sure I'm not speaking out of turn here that all, all members of the committee would, would would support that package coming forward. Mm -hmm. I'll leave it there, Chair. Okay, thank you, Andy. Thanks for that. Um, I've got then Sinead, Mark, Fran, Robin. So Sinead. Thank you, Chair, um, and thanks to Patrick and David for coming in. It's very timely. Um, I suppose that you're you're with us today. Um, I too want to offer my congratulations and, and wish you the best of luck for the, the upcoming game against um, Slovakia. I want to first associate myself with the comments that Johnny made in terms of the, um, the, I, the IFA Code of, of Ethics and Code of Conduct. Um, you know, it's quite alarming. I think you know, obviously signing up to that should be a prerequisite for any nomination to any, any board or any committee position. Um, and it's quite alarming that that's, you know, that, that's not the the scenario that we're dealing with here and I again associate with my, myself with the comments that Johnny made in terms of a swift resolution to that. Um, I suppose I, ha I have a number of issues that I'd like to raise. Um, we had a briefing last week from NIFL, um, a very stark briefing uh, on the, uh, the the outlook, the very bleak outlook facing uh, the NIFL clubs um, and I, you know, I support the ask. Um, uh, from NIFL of the Department and of the Minister in terms of fin a financial uh, rescue package, not just for soccer but for all um, all sporting codes. 
Um, and I'm pleased to, to, to know that the, the Minister is looking at, looking at that and hopefully looking at it very positively. Um, but I think we have to, you know, we have to ask in terms of yourselves as the, the governing body. Um, I made the point last week at the committee that you know, the, the priority should be that no club, whether premiership or, or below, um, should be going out of, out of business or going bust during this time. And every effort should be made by all those who have responsibility to ensure that doesn't happen. So just from your own, your own point of view, um, Patrick and David, you know, cause we, we know that the, the IFA do have a, a significant amount of usable reserves. Um, I just want to know, will any of those reserves be used should the need arise um, to ensure that no club, either premiership or below, goes, goes, out, goes bust or goes out of business? Um, and is that something that you're, you're looking at uh, in the time ahead? Um, if I could be um, perhaps direct on that one, Sinead, um, we, we are a separate business from the individual clubs. They, they, are, they are members of our association. Um, but, but they are separate businesses, as I, as I mentioned before, between the 12 clubs of the Premiership, for example, they would normally turn over uh, 2.1 million or thereabouts in terms of their, their ticket revenue, uh, and that's been missing this year. Uh, we've been able to uh, fill a part of that gap through the funding that comes from FIFA. Um, but, you know, our, we also have to look at um, our own sustainability as well. Um, we, we've been around for 140 years. Uh, we're the fourth oldest uh, national football association in the world. And, um, and we have to make sure that we have to make sure um, that we're sustainable. Um, we are um, something like three and a half million pounds down ourselves this year. Um, we have made very good use, I think, optimal use of the government's uh, furlough scheme. Uh, in that uh, many of our many of our people have been uh, um, furloughed over uh, the period since April, on and off, uh, part part furlough, full furlough, uh, fully back at work. It's been a real uh, a mix based upon uh, what we've needed on any particular week. Uh, but the you know the staff have been um, uh, have managed themselves very well through that in a in a very very difficult year. Um, but. We have a, a very wide range of activities that we fulfill on behalf of football throughout the whole of Northern Ireland. And we need to utilize our funding for that. So it wouldn't be part of our plan at this point to, to dig into our reserves to, um, you know, to uh, fill further holes within, uh, within member clubs. But what we are committed to do uh, and I appreciate that, uh, that you're fully supportive of, of us and of the minister in this, is we will work with the minister, with the department and with the executive to, um, to try and ensure that the funding package for the whole of sport and football in particular is right and that, um, and that can help save all of the clubs that you know, provide such great value within our communities. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I suppose just to clarify a point as well that you made about the UEFA hat trick fund. Um, so you said that uh, you, you yourselves in association had no ability to reallocate this. That's not entirely true because UEFA did stipulate that due to COVID pressures, um, associations could spend that money as they please. So are you saying that you just didn't have the capability financially to spend that? Just, just for clarity. Yeah. Uh, what, what, I was, what I was saying, Sinead, is that yes, uh, UEFA allowed uh, more flexibility than they would normally allow within hat-trick funding, uh, but, but we as an association have lots of commitments already for that hat-trick funding, and, uh, and, and we're maintaining those commitments. I mean, we're, we're doing our best not to cut off any of the things that we normally do within the Irish Football Association, because we know that they mean so much to people uh, throughout the country, whether, whether it be boys and girls taking their you know, their first kicks of a ball all the way through to the senior international men's and women's team. For example, um, our, our women's team um, went to the Faroe Islands recently. Um, you know, uh, a great 6-0 win, if any of you saw the highlights of it. And, and we're in with a good chance uh, of, uh, with our senior women's team of, um, of playing at our first ever women's Euro. Um, you know, keep our fingers crossed for the game in Belarus next week and for the last two home games against Belarus, 
Pharaohs again, and we might get a playoff place or even better direct qualification. But we're having to spend significantly more money on keeping that particular show on the road this year. So um, the yes, UEFA gave us some theoretical freedom in the first place, um, but we've got some significantly increased costs to, to even keep the show on the road ourselves, which we've done so far, and we're down considerably in funding ourselves. So it's a balancing act. And, um, and our job, um, David's job as the president, the rest of the board, um, and myself as chief executive, is to try and um, you know, balance all of those things and make sure that we get through uh, the end of this um, still uh, in, a, in a solvent position ourselves. Thanks for that, Patrick. And Chair, if you just indulge me, I just have two more points I want to make. Um, I suppose in regards to the uh, sub-regional, which has um, been a topic of interest for, all, for this committee and for, for all the members um, since we reformed back in January, um, I was quite alarmed, and I, I suppose anybody watching this, any of the clubs watching this will be you know, maybe a little bit alarmed um, when you, you were talking there, Patrick, about uh, you know, a regional or a national stadium is going to be the our training centre, sorry, is going to be the top priority for the sub-regional fund from your point of view. Um, you know, that just makes alarm bells ring for me straight away, and I'm sure anybody watching in from any of the, the clubs will, will be uh, of the same opinion. Um, you know, certainly from my own point of view, and I know um, I don't presume to speak on behalf of the Minister, but I know speaking to her, one of the priorities will be that uh, the sub-regional fund is regionally balanced. Um, and that, there, that it meets um, objective need is one of, one of its criteria. So, you know, can we just get some reassurances? Perhaps you're not in a position to do that now, but maybe a bit some clarity that um, whenever that fund does come along, hopefully sooner rather than later, that there will be a regional balance um, as one of the criteria associated with, us, with it and that you will ensure that that happens. Um, Sinead, I would, I would certainly hope that there will be very significant regional balance in it because um, you know we have uh, we have football clubs uh, throughout the le length and breadth of Northern Ireland, and uh, we also hope that it will be a challenge fund, and there will be very clear criteria around it, so that um, when when clubs apply in uh, into a particular category within the within the scheme, uh, and we all hope it will be it will be launched uh, as soon as possible. Um, that when people apply in, um, those applications will be properly assessed. Um, our view would be that we would need independent assessment help to ensure that um, appropriate decisions are made. Uh, and, and there will be a regional balance in there. We would certainly hope so. In terms of the, the National Training Centre, though, I'm, I just wanted to come back on the, on the point about alarm bells. Um, We've, uh, we, we've had the National Training Centre as a, as a priority within our sub-regional strategy since the sub-regional strategy started. Um, it's, uh, it's the sort of project which uh, gives hope and aspiration to every single potential elite footballer from the age of five upwards within the country. And, and we're not suggesting anything which, it, which is different from, from what any other country would have. Um, you know, lots of countries have got uh, very significant and, and incredibly expensive national training centers. Um, we would be by no means suggesting that we spend huge amounts of money on this, uh, but we think it's a, a, very, uh, a very significant priority for, uh, for, our, um, for our future. Uh, for for aspirational elite footballers as they make their way either um, you know to wear the green shirt or alternatively even just to ply their trade in the professional game in England or Scotland or elsewhere and uh, and we'd like to see it become a reality as soon as we can. Uh, thanks, Patrick. And lastly, you'd be glad to know. Um, just you know, I, I can't let the the meeting pass without um, you know mentioning the. Uh, what transpired, the actions that transpired over the weekend from Friday and, and Saturday as well in relation to the uh, whether or not fans will be allowed into games. Um, I suppose, you know, we all want to see the safe return of fans to games, to all sports. Um, I certainly do as a, as a sports fan, but I think the key word is safe. Um, you know, my understanding is that that advice came from the CMO and the CSO. So it's just, uh, just so people can be reassured you know, what alternative public health advice did the IFA seek um, over the weekend that, that reassures you enough 
to disregard the advice that's coming from the department and from the CSO and the, C and the CMO in relation to allowing fans to travel to games? Well, I think all, all I would say on that, Sinead, is uh, I think it's our job to uh, obey the regulations um, as, they, as they're printed, and, uh, and, and we obey the regulations. We, uh, the games that were played over the weekend were all played uh, under the uh, under the Egypt, if you like, of the of the safety advisory groups. Safe capacities have been agreed. Uh, structures have been agreed. Hand sanitization, temperature checking, social distancing, all of that have been agreed with the relevant uh, safety authorities for every ground. And um, we abided by the regulations, and we'll continue to abide by the regulations. So you're content to still um, encourage fans to travel to games. We're, we're content to abide by the regulations, and um, and we we will we will uh, continue to do that. Okay, that's that's perfect. Thanks very much, Patrick and David. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sinead. Um, I'm going to move on to Mark. Mark Durkin. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, gentlemen, for coming in, or well, for zooming in uh, to us today and, and for the presentation. Uh, I'd like to join with other uh, members, I suppose, and voicing my pleasure uh, to, to see the national, the Northern Ireland <laughs> international uh, team doing so well, and I do wish them well in the Euro uh, playoff final, although I would very much like to have seen an All Ireland. Mm. Uh, finally, I look forward to the day where we see an All Ireland team. I might pick your brain on that a wee, a wee bit uh, at, at the end here. But I was going to ask one question. Well, I was going to ask more than one, but I think of only one left that hasn't been asked, and that was around the categorisation or, or what's categorised as elite sport here in Northern Ireland as opposed to other jurisdictions. I think here, uh, in, in terms of the AFA, we're looking just at the premiership teams. Uh, and I was wondering about what impact that is having, therefore, on championship teams, many of whom have maybe half or maybe even more of their players on professional contracts. Yeah, um, Mark, I, I understand exactly exactly where you're coming from on that. And, and you know, thank you again for the good words in terms of... Uh, what happened in Sarajevo, and, um, and we're looking forward to the, uh, you know, to, to the game against uh, Slovakia. Um, the the, the definition, of, definition that we've come up with of, of elite in the in the current context of, of trying to, as everybody is, uh, prevent the uh, community spread of uh, of COVID nineteen. Um, yes, it's a complicated one, and and it's aimed at a low volume of individuals operating at the pinnacle of their sport effectively. And, and so um, where we settled on in that was, uh, was the premiership um, and international teams as well. We, we understand that you know, rugby have, uh, have come up with a definition, uh, GAA have come up with a definition, et cetera. And I appreciate where it gets complicated is at the margins, um, where, where there are always gonna be people who disagree. And so obviously for us, the championship is, is the closest to the margin uh, because some of those teams Will have been premiership, premiership teams in the past. Uh, all of them, I imagine, will aspire to be premiership teams next season. Uh, and, and so, yes, it's, it's tougher on them than it is on everyone else. But um, we're one week into the, in, into the four-week uh, circuit breaker at this point, and, uh, and, and the sooner we're through it all, the better, we hope. Oh, I think we'd all agree with, with that sentiment. Absolutely. And then I had asked uh, your friends or counterparts in Niffle last week about their view on an all-island league at some stage in the future. I was conscious of the fact that I think 10 out of 12 of the Premiership clubs had voted in, in favour of, of that sort of direction of travel. I was just wondering, do the IFA have a, a view on that, a corporate view? Or what could you see that the merits in, in such a league uh, bring them to the game, to the teams? And are there any potential drawbacks that you could identify? Um, well, it, it, it's an incredibly interesting uh, question, Mark, and, uh, and I'm, I'm glad you raised it because I, I, you know, I, I thought someone would raise it today. So, so thanks for doing that. 
Um, the this has been around for a while, and clearly, you know, our sport has developed differently from other sports, and uh, and, and things happen over time, and the economics go a certain way, etc. Um, the, the 12 teams in the in, in the Premier League at the moment here, the Premiership, the Danske Bank Premiership, um, as I've said before, they 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 turn over about 2.1 million pounds in uh, in ticket money in a year. Um, they would turn over a little bit more in terms of their commercial revenues, and and there are small broadcasting deals as well. Yeah. But those those broadcasting deals aren't worth a fortune. But we, uh, you know, we tend to think that we understand the, uh, the the broadcasting market both here and in the Republic of Ireland as well. We have uh, good relationships with the FAI. Uh, they, they've been through their travails recently, as uh, as we all know. Um, but uh, but the president and myself have uh, have spent a, a fair bit of time um, working with uh, with the interim management down there to uh, you know to to try and help them as much as we can. So we un we understand the market. Uh, in the Republic, we understand the market here. Um, we don't believe at this point that there is anywhere near enough money in a uh, in an All Ireland League concept for for it to for it to fly safely. Um, you know, there there have been numbers that have been uh, thrown around that um, that as we as the if you like the industry experts get into them a little bit. Um, you know, we we can't make those numbers stack up. So. If anybody can make those numbers stack up, that would be an entirely different proposition. Um, you know, economics is always uh, it, it's a wonderful science, uh, and it goes back to Charles Dickens as well, doesn't it? You know, um, income nineteen and sixpence, expenditure twenty shillings, result misery, etc. Um, that's where uh, that's where I fear we would be if we if we jump too quickly into something like that, because uh, I'm just not sure the money would be there to. Uh, to make it work for all of the clubs that it would need to work for. Having said that, we, you know, we're, we're always uh, interested in looking at concepts, uh, and, and we'll continue to work with our member clubs. We'll continue to work with UEFA. Uh, we have a great relationship with the FAI. Uh, we'll continue to work with them as well as their as their new management settles in. And um, uh, let's see. Uh, but at the moment, I think the the concept as uh, as presented just doesn't stack up anywhere near economically. I might add, I just might add to that, we have, uh, as Patrick has uh, indicated, we have very good relations with the uh, FAI. We do have a President's Cup for the two Junior Cup winners, and we also have the, uh, currently it's un Unite the Union uh, Champions Cup for the two uh, league champions to play off in. That's been somewhat uh, delayed this year because of COVID, both those competitions. Uh, but we're not averse to uh, to uh, working with our neighbours in uh, in the uh, FAI. Yeah, the Satanta Cup had been pretty successful when it was running as well. Uh, but no, that's uh, fine. Th thank you for addressing that. And I suppose you're quoting Dickens. I don't know if this is the best of times or worst or worst of times. Uh, to, you know, to be pushing on this, but it is something that that I think is out there. And I don't know it's going to get back in the, the, the bottle again, but definitely it is worth looking at. And you can't make decisions without looking at the e economics, but how they will stack up. And it has to be, I suppose, what's best for the sport across uh, the island and what gets people playing, keeps people playing, and, and, and keeps these clubs, th not just where I think that the focus now is always and has been for some time on clubs surviving we have to look at clubs thriving you know and what will really uh, maximize their opportunities to do so in the future but not thank you man thank you mark um i've got fra then robin and then johnny wants to act a supplementary after that and it will be a supplementary uh fra sure thank you very much and just a very welcome gentleman this morning and again like other uh, members of the committee i'd like to congratulate us uh, on the recent win, and it's not lost in me that uh, the person that scored the, the last penalty lives fairly close to me and, and has his uh, lifeblood in football with a local uh, team and, and, and things. So, the, uh, congratulations. Uh, and uh, maybe the first question is, and I didn't think I would have any other questions to answer, that, that uh, the questions have been fairly extensive here this morning. Uh, and I, uh, but 
Uh, could you could you explain to me how, how you decide on the difference between elite and non-elite and how, how that decision is made? Well, well, well Fran, um, <clears throat> to a certain extent, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a different uh, decision for each sport. Um, but the, in, in the conversations we had with uh, the Department for Communities people, we were, uh, we were guided that really, uh, in terms of elite at the moment, we're, we're looking at the, uh, the, the sports people who are you know, at the pinnacle of their profession, um, and, and that's the pinnacle within Northern Ireland. Uh, and so we, we determined um, at the time back in the summer that uh, elite for the, for the foreseeable period is the uh, teams within the Danske Bank Premiership, uh, and we appreciate that gives a that, you know that that, that gives a, a level of disappointment to uh, to anyone who's in other leagues, um, but we you know we, we all have to do our part at the moment, and uh, and hopefully we can get back to um, normal uh, community society as soon as possible, and we can get other teams playing. Um, but at the moment, you know, we're, we're having to play our part by just having elite football run, uh, and that is just the Danske Bank Premiership. To, to see in terms of uh, other clubs, uh, just lower down, uh, the, 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 there used to be the progression uh, of they win their leagues, then it was uh, uh, some went up, some went down. Has uh, that been uh, stalled uh, at the present? No, that's um, that, that's that's running as as normal. So, um, Portadown, for example, won the uh, won the championship last year, uh, and they've kicked off the new season in the uh, in the Premiership. So, uh, so promotion and relegation is still operating. Yeah, th thank you, thank you very much, Fred. Um, uh, there's just a, 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 a couple of qu uh, questions. To see if there's any uh, package uh, that the minister brings forward. Uh, and, and in terms of uh, soccer, uh, I take it that, that that would be delivered through your sales. Uh, I take it that would filter through all leagues uh, to 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 help them and uh, and uh, survive. And and uh, like the 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 chair of the committee, you know, it was quite frightening to listen to uh, the people who came in here last week talk about uh, the possibility of clubs maybe going out uh, of existence. Some clubs. Uh, like yourselves, that the, the, the teams that are maybe a hundred years old, and the difficulty. So, would that filter down uh, th th through them? And, and it's just a, the, the, the one of the reasons they ask that is that I've mentioned Liam Boyce, you know that, uh, and, and and the likes of intermediate football, uh, they're, they're all there. Uh, the, the 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 fundraising uh, possibilities have also stalled by and large. Uh, because of the, the, the conditions and position that we find ourselves in. But even below that, you know, in my own area, uh, you have uh, Michael Latta, Willow Bank, and St James's Swifts and others uh, mm -hmm. who turn out, turn out every week. And then, but they, 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 uh, they find it difficult uh, surviving, uh, especially in the present circumstances. And any broad package that came together would have gone down uh, to that level of, uh, of football. Uh, to ensure that there's no closing. Because at the end of the day, I know you talk about elite football, you know, most of the people that you have in, in elite football have their beginnings in the Michael Lattas of this world, uh, uh, the St James of Swift of this world, and the pa Willow Banks of this world. No, Fran, you're absolutely right in that respect. And um, we, we would very much hope that uh, any package that the, the, the minister and the executive agrees uh, would be able to be spread throughout the entire pyramid of football. There's, you know, the, the, there is a big difference, if you like, between um, you know the costs that a, a Danske Bank Premiership team, uh, such as Crusaders or Cliftonville or Glenavon, would have, uh, because they've got bigger stadia, they've got uh, they've got wage bills, etc., compared to a Willowbank or an Immaculata. But equally, those clubs will have rental fees. They'll have insurance they'll have even basics like washing the kit etc and so it, it is important that uh, any package is able to reach throughout the pyramid um, one thing i would say is that um, of the fifa funding that we talked about earlier which was eight hundred thousand uh, us dollars uh, that we have allocated to clubs uh, plus uh, sorry that's to the men's clubs plus one hundred thousand dollars to to the women's clubs that are, are playing in northern ireland as well 
Um, that's that's gone all the way through uh, intermediate football, for example, as direct grants to clubs, and we've and we've kept some of it back. Uh, where we are, we, we've got a fund for uh, for junior football. Uh, where we are, we are still deciding what's the best way to uh, to distribute that within junior football because it's the it's the vast majority of clubs. Um, but some of that FIFA funding will will go all the way through the pyramid as well. And, but we hope that the uh, the executive uh, funding package for sports would allow us to to do something similar. Okay, thank you, thank you, gentlemen. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Robin. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, to David and Patrick, you're very welcome uh, to to the committee today. I suppose in uh, every member of the uh, committee recognises the the benefits of of, of sport in in general, in terms of the, and I suppose particularly at this time in the situation, the health situation we're in about to both the physical and indeed the mental health uh, aspects of, of our economy and, and indeed the, 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 what sport gives in terms of cohesion uh, within a, a community. I think where it is not recognised is the contribution of sport to the economy. It's not something that sits apart from the economic well-being of, of Northern Ireland, but indeed it is a, a, an integral part of, of, of our economy. Uh, and for that reason, I suppose the committee were, uh, for a variety of reasons, the committee were somewhat perturbed last uh, week uh, in, in the NIFL presentation, or listening to the NIFL presentation, and the very precarious situation that some of the, the clubs find themselves in, and that has already been referred to by other members uh, of the c committee. I think uh, either Patrick or David, I, I just do. I have a, a very simple uh, question. O of the FIFA money, the, that was the one million dollars. Uh, am I correct in that? Which is now, trans, you've uh, indicated to us, is now eight hundred thousand and one hundred thousand for the men and the women's game. Uh, perhaps could, could you, uh, even if not today, and I suspect it wouldn't be today, but could you uh, inform the committee as to how that was shared out uh, with the various clubs and what the money was allocated for? Uh, well, the first first thing I would say, Robin, is uh, is we we allocated the money directly to the clubs, and um, and we allocated it um, primarily to help them alleviate their running costs. So we, 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 did, uh, we, we did give a couple of, um, <clears throat> I suppose, a couple of stipulations to the clubs that we were allocating the money to. Um, but we know that they, uh, that they have more bills at this point than the money that we were providing would meet. So, uh, so we, di we didn't feel that there was going to be any, any difficulty in those clubs uh, properly using that funding that, uh, that, that came through. And... Uh, uh, and so that, hopefully, that money, that eight hundred thousand that's gone out to to clubs over the last few weeks, uh, dollars, of course, not pounds, um, has helped to uh, alleviate issues uh, throughout the pyramid. Um, I think uh, I, I don't have the full details here as to um, precisely what the uh, what the what the makeup was. Clearly, as I mentioned before in my in my answer to uh, to Fra. The um, the Premiership clubs have got the you know the biggest bills, whether it be wages, whether it be stadium infrastructure, whether it be insurance, etc. So more money went to Premiership clubs than uh, than to other clubs, and then it was on a sliding scale below that. But um, yeah, we could we could have a look at uh, uh, going back and finding those exact numbers. I, I think that's me finished, Chair, and I look forward to Patrick sharing that information via yourself, Chair. Absolutely. Okay, thank you, Robin. Thank you. Um, Johnny, you have a yeah. short supplementary. Th thanks, Chair, and I appreciate you, you allowing me back in this because it was raised by Andy and Sinead, and I just wanted to, to further elaborate on the sub regional funding aspect. Uh, again, w you know, it's been going on a long time, and I understand uh, the regional need in relation to some clubs seeing that that gets down to them. You mentioned the regional training centre as a priority, and, and I support that in the round. Uh, you mentioned maybe not are particularly partnering with other organisations uh, to maybe <coughs> deliver such a project because uh, funding will be limited and, and you will want to have a spread. 
I remember, and I think it's going back some years ago, there was conversations with yourselves and the legacy Craig Alvin Council uh, about mm. potential for that for that project, and I'm sure maybe engagement with other councils. Ha, ha, has there been any further engagement with councils about that and potentially what they can bring to the table to help deliver such a project? And if not, when do you expect, in anticipation of the sub-regional scheme, uh, to have that interaction with third-party organisations? Well, I think, Johnny, uh, what I would say is that there are, there are third-party third organisations uh, other than councils that, um, that we could have interaction with as well, but we're, we're very open to, uh, to having interaction with councils. We've certainly spoken to uh, Belfast City Council in the, uh, in, in the relatively recent past uh, about this particular project and about sub-regional. And, uh, and we're open to uh, to talking with uh, with any potential partners. To be honest. Okay, that's perfect. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Johnny. Um, Patrick and David, thank you. I suppose I just want to say, um, just uh, on a personal level, I have one piece of football apparel in my entire wardrobe, and that's a Northern Ireland top that I bought back in 2016. <laughs> and I kind of, when you reflect back to that time and the buoyancy. And the you know the mood even within with so many people within Northern Ireland at that time, and you look at the position we're in now with COVID, not with football, but with COVID, you know, and it's such changed times and the way we've all had to adapt. Um, so I just want to wish certainly Northern Ireland all the very best in their forthcoming game, and I might even don my Northern Ireland shirt that night. <laughs> so am I at home when I'm cooking the dinner. Um, so I just want to wish you all the very best and thank you very much for briefing the committee today. And I think following on from this briefing, members will decide what they want to do. But certainly, I think that one of those, uh, one of the things we will be doing is asking for further clarification on what way uh, some sort of rescue pa package for sport in general um, and how that's going to be developed. So can I thank you, gentlemen, for your time? Yeah, th thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, um, I, I, uh, I think it was a very frank, very open, uh, uh, an excellent uh, conversation that we've had this morning. Uh, I'm going to thank all, the, all all those who asked the questions, and of course, I've got the chief executive with me, who works with the day-to-day -day running and management of the organisation, and he's everything right on the top of his head. He hasn't really very many notes here, so he's done very well. I'm also very impressed with the the committee. Uh, it's excellent, all those lovely uh, comments, and Chairman, you've got a, a jersey as well. well that, that's great, and uh, we do hope to uh, we hope, do hope we do look forward to the match on the twelfth of November, um, and uh, we, we look we, we look forward to uh, to hopefully winning that game, uh, and uh, but above all, we've got to think of the uh, situation that the uh, uh, the the world is in over COVID, uh, and that no, no matter what happens, no matter how many spectators we have in this wonderful stadium, uh, that uh, that safety is the is the most important thing on that night. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks. Good luck. Bye bye. <laughs> okay, members, we're going to just take a short break. Um, if members would take their ease while we prepare the room for our witnesses are coming in in person. Sure. Okay, just before that, sorry, yeah. Johnny, did you want no, to? No, it's just because uh, I know we'll probably be moving on to okay. a different session, but. I think, and probably members all agree, and I know Andy did say it, um, given last week's presentation by NIFL and IFA today and other sporting organisations with the pressure, it is a point of priority now that we gain clarity from the Minister. I understand a financial package is in the rounds being talked about, but I, I think it, it's, it's critical now uh, that with haste this committee makes representation to the department via letter or whatever it may be to uh, gain clarity as to the size of financial package that we're looking at and how that's going to be spread across the different sporting organisations to, to relieve them in what is going to be a very difficult time. Okay, 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 thank you. Um, any other members want to make a comment before we, we take a break here? I, agree with that, yes. um, I don't see anybody. Andy, do you have any further comment before we, we take yes, a break? Sir, I, just, I didn't get a chance to come back in just before the guys left. Um, I know it was referenced to the actual work of the Foundation right across Northern Ireland. Just wondering if we could follow up to uh, the RFA and just ask them if they could uh, put together a short, succinct, uh, succinct uh, briefing paper on the work of the Foundation, because I'm sure we would each like to get that information disseminated down into our respective constituencies. 
Yep, absolutely. Thanks, Andy, for that. No, we'll do that as well. Thanks, Chair. Okay, okay, members, um, take your ease for a few minutes and we'll get the room prepared for our next witnesses. Mm -hmm. And we're going to then move on to agenda item six, which is committee de deliberations on the clauses of the pension schemes bill. Members have been provided with papers starting at page 44 and a copy of the bill as it is at page 90. You will also have received hard copies of the bills in your pigeonholes this week. Um, can I inform members that the committee will today commence its deliberations on the pension scheme bill on a clause by clause basis um, with Barry and Doreen from the department and Paul Stitt from the bill office is, has also joined the meeting via Starleaf. Um, this is not the formal clause by clause stage, rather it is an opportunity to comprehensively review uh, with the department any issues raised by stakeholders or committee members and to ask for clarification on how the bill addresses these concerns and any additional action that the department intends to take to address any of the concerns. Um, if members are minded to propose amendments as we proceed through the clauses, I would ask the clerk to liaise with the bill office to bring in wording. Um, of the amendments um, to the meeting on the 5th of, the 12th of November. Um, the officials will stop um, after each clause and then I'll invite the committee to make any comments. Um, so if members are content, then can I welcome Jerry McCann and Doreen Roy back to the meeting again. Good to see you both again. Mm -hmm. And then Jerry, I'll ask you to give a brief, or you are going to give a brief uh, overview of each of the clauses before, as I say, I ask members to come in. So we'll start off then um, with clause one, master trust schemes definition. Okay, I, and so Doreen will do the brief outline uh, and then I will try to answer any questions that you may have. On on. Okay, Doreen. Hi Doreen, thank you. Okay, um, part one of the bill, master trust. Um, Definition of a master trust scheme, clauses one to two. Clause one defines a master trust scheme for the purposes of the new authorisation and supervision regime. A master trust is an occupational pension scheme which offers money purchase benefits either alone or in conjunction with other benefits and is used or intended to be used by two or more employers that are not connected with each other. Relevant public service pension schemes are excluded. The definition is intentionally broad to discourage schemes that may seek to change their structure in order to avoid authorisation. That's clause one. Okay, thank you, Doreen. Okay, members, um, anything they want to address there? Are they content that we move on to clause two? Content. Andy, are you content? Okay, thank you. Then we'll move on to clause two. Clause two. This defines relevant public service pension scheme for the purposes of clause one, which excludes relevant public service pension schemes from the definition of a master trust. Broadly, these are occupational pension schemes established by or under legislation, such as the Public Service Pensions Act, Northern Ireland 2014, in general, public service pension schemes already have specific requirements placed upon them when they are set up to mitigate risks. For this reason, they are not included within the scope of the Master Trust authorisation regime. That's clause two. Thank you, Doreen. Again, members, any comments or queries on clause two in the room? No, no all fine. Andy, again, do you any queries or comment? Thank you. Okay, we'll move on then to clause three. This is the authorisation applications, etc. Clauses three to six. Clause three prohibits a person from operating a master trust scheme unless that scheme is authorised by the pensions regulator. This is the foundation of the authorisation regime. It also sets out the consequences of breaking this prohibition. The clause also gives the regulator the power to issue a civil penalty if the prohibition has been broken. This acts as an additional deterrent to anyone who may seek to operate a master trust scheme without authorisation. Finally, the clause defines the term operates for the purposes of this part of the bill. A person operates a master trust scheme if that person accepts money from members or employers in relation to the scheme or enters into an agreement with an employer that relates to the provision of pension savings for employees or other workers. That's clause three. 
Thank you, Doreen. Again, members in the room, any comments or queries? Okay. And um, I, I know you realise I'm not asking Mark. He'll put his hand up if he does have any. But I'll ask Andy again. <coughs> any any uh, content with clause three? Okay. Thank you. Um, Doreen, clause four then. Application for authorisation. This clause provides for the trustees of a master trust scheme to apply to the pensions regulator for authorisation and it sets out details regarding the content of that application and the application process. The application must include certain key information. For example, the scheme's latest accounts, the latest accounts of each scheme funder, the scheme's business plan and the scheme's continuity strategy. This key information must be provided so that the regulator can assess whether it is satisfied that the scheme meets the authorisation criteria. This clause also allows the Department to make regulations to set out other information to be included within an application so that further changes can be accounted for and the application process can remain robust. Schemes will be charged a one-off application fee payable to the regulator at the point of application. That's clause four. Thank you, Doreen. Members in the room, OK, I have two. Fran and Kelly. Sure, it's, a, and it, it's just a thing that's it's crossed my mind a couple of times, and uh, I'm just unsure about it. See, when it, uh, the, the likes of a, a master trust, how do they survive? They, they obviously must they get money from government, they, or do they draw their uh, survival from the, uh, the pay, people that pay the trusts? Well, 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 actually, how, how they uh, you know, actually, um, survive is they are able to levy an, an annual charge, yeah. but which under the law here is able to be higher than I, I, I'm 0.75%. The average charge is actually um, under uh, a, a such 0.5%, uh, but, but that's how they generate their uh, money. You know, that's where the income is comes that, from. Is that 0.5 of the total? Yeah, of the, of, of the total fund per annum. Yeah. Um, you know, that is the maximum charge which they can levy. Um, okay, thank but, you. But as I say, under law, it, it, it actually just has to be under um, 0 0.75, but the average is actually under 0 0.5. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. thank you. Kelly? I was just going to ask about um, it's 2A, the scheme's latest accounts. Um, given the number of master trusts that we have in Northern Ireland, it's likely that we will have new entries to the market. Um, under a company's house, you don't have to submit annual accounts until 18 months after you've started business. So I'm just wondering the latest, the scheme's latest accounts, um, if that's a new master trust that has been set up, are they given that, you know, will they have to be trading for, how can they trade for 18 months before they get accounts? Um, to be honest, that's one which I would actually have to look at further because that's bringing me into company's law. Yeah. You know, from which I don't have any real expertise, but I can certainly go away and sort of tease that out slightly for you. Yeah. Um, but but I think a new scheme after my, I, I mean, as far as I understand it, they that you know they would have to you know such provide their accounts. Though though actually the accounts only have to be given within a, a certain period of months after the end of the period anyway. You know, you know there is a bit of a an, an extra. Uh, as a, as a you know, it was a word period of uh, and so grace, you know, you know, for these to be supplied by, but but I can certainly check that point out further for you. And would accounts, if if the master trust is, I know they have to be registered within the UK to operate within the UK, but mm. can they present accounts if they're an existing master trust from outside the UK for those to be considered as a first point of entry if they join the, the UK one? Um, well, 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 actually, once the scheme is actually set up, but it, but, but it would only have to be doing its accounts at, at the end of the first year. You know, the you know the annual account would be done at the end of the first year, uh, as part of, of the overall uh, so process for them to be assessed. They would ha have to say as, as to what is the amount of money that they have, for example, their scheme accounts, meaning you know, uh, you know, you know as to how you actually is the scheme funded. Do you, do you actually have enough money for this to be run? Okay. I think it just would be interesting if we could just check that scheme's latest accounts because if it is a new one, mm -hmm. Companies House is saying 18 months yeah. and we're saying at the end, and I know there could be flexibility there, but yeah. it's just a time. Sir, so, you know, I'm sorry, I can say check it out, but uh, you know, I say that's bringing me to Companies Law, which I yeah. don't really have any financial so knowledge of. Thank okay, thanks, Kelly. Um, Andy, <laughs> any comment? Are you okay with uh, four? No, I can answer. Okay, thank you. Um, going close five. Decision on application.
Clause 5 sets out the procedure the regulator must follow when it receives an application from a master trust scheme which is seeking to become authorised. The regulator must decide whether it is satisfied that the scheme meets the authorisation criteria. If the regulator is not satisfied that it does, it will not grant authorisation and the regulator is required to make a decision on an application within six months. This clause introduces the authorisation criteria, which are that the persons involved in the scheme are fit and proper persons. We'll talk more on this at Clause 7. That the scheme is financially sustainable. We'll talk more on this at Clauses 8 and 9. That each scheme funder meets certain requirements. We'll talk more on this at Clause 10. That the systems and processes used in running the scheme are sufficient to ensure that it is run effectively. We'll talk more on this at Clause 11 and that the scheme has an adequate continuity strategy. We'll talk more on this at Clause 12. Where the regulator finds that it is satisfied that the scheme meets the authorisation criteria, it must grant the authorisation, notify the applicant and add the scheme to its list of authorised master trust schemes. If the regulator is not satisfied, it must refuse authorisation and notify the applicant of its decision, including the reasons for its decision and details of the right of referral to the tribunal. That's clause five. Thank you, Doreen. I know, Johnny, you had your hand up, or do you want to wait until Doreen goes through the other clauses? So it might be pertinent to one of those, or do you want to ask? Yeah, no, it's just, it's just briefly as to the six-month period for, you know, decisions within, uh, for on receiving a new application. Is that standard six months? It, it seems to me, probably not doing something like this before, it seems very long, or is that, is there any particular reason why it's six months? Well, well, like for the six months was to ensure that the pensions regulator would have the time to, you know, actually go through all, all the various bits of information which is being provided. Um, as you as you know, the amount of money which can be involved in, in these schemes is actually very substantial. Therefore, it's absolutely vital that they get it right before they say that the scheme can authorise. Okay, and you'd probably come on to this ne next, so don't answer it now if you don't have to, but it's the tribunal then that you've asked for in terms of the right to appeal. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there a defined time frame in which that has to be conducted in? Um, I don't think there's a, a set time frame that they have to hear the appeal within a certain specified period of time, but obviously they would seek to hear it as, as soon as they could. Uh, but, the, uh, but that enters into a, a, a formal, as it were, out, outside process, which is independent, okay, to make sure that this has been looked at by people who aren't involved in the process. 100%. Thanks. Okay. Any other members in the room around Clause 5? No, nothing. Um, Andy, any comment? Clause 5? No, no, she's Thank you. All right, Grant. Okay, during then, close six. Referral to Tribunal of Refusal to Grant Authorisation. This clause provides for appeal rights if the regulator refuses to grant authorisation to a master trust scheme. The appeal may be brought by the trustees of the scheme or by any other person who appears to the tribunal to be directly affected by the decision to refuse authorisation. That's clause six. Any comments from members in the room? No, nothing. Andy, anything from you on that plus six? No, thank you. Thank you. Okay, during that plus seven. Authorisation criteria clauses seven to twelve. Clause 7 introduces the first of the five authorisation criteria set out in clause five. It means that the regulator must be satisfied that the persons involved in a master trust scheme are fit and proper persons to act in their roles. It lists the key people whom the regulator must assess as fit and proper to act in their role in relation to the scheme. For example, the trustees, the scheme funder and the scheme strategist. This list can be extended under regulations. It also gives the regulator the power to assess a person who promotes or markets the scheme. Regulations can specify further individuals acting in a particular capacity whom the regulator may assess in order to determine whether they are a fit and proper person for their role. This clause also makes it clear that in addressing a person's fitness and propriety, the regulator is able to take into account relevant matters relating to that person's individual or business connections. For example, a trustee is connected with a company if they are a director or shadow director of that company or where a person is taken to have control of that company. And that's clause seven. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kelly? Can I just ask, um, what's the definition of a person connected with that person? I know we have it in politics quite a bit. What is a connected person? Is it defined anywhere? 
Um, well, well, for example, Dorian gave one of the examples there. You know, you know, you know the person could, could be a, a connected person if, in fact, they were involved in a the um, sort of same business or, or they had some business dealings with each other. That's just uh, one example. example. That, well, yeah. that, that but it's, it's one example. not, for instance, we have it where it's, you know, spouse, um, child, sibling, parent, you know, there, there's personal connections as well as business connections. Um, I think this tends to be business connections, yeah. um, but again, I'll okay. verify that. I mean, it's the kind of things which we're looking for there is, you know, we, um, you know, we actually want to make sure that they're not really part of the same business. You know, that, that's really what we're trying to get out there. But, but, but we're also trying to check that this person in, the, in their past hasn't been, you know, um, has ever been working as a, a, a such um, a, a full-time director and, and has, has ended up being disqualified, for example, or, or indeed that they have al always been solvent, um, just in case there's any uh, entered previous um, entered cases of, of having been in, involved with the firm, which has ended up you know, actually going bankrupt. You know, those, those are the kinds of um, things we are trying to tease out. Yeah, it can be anywhere in the world, not just UK. Uh, yes, yes. Now, you know, it's not just inside the UK. You know, they will be seeking you to verify. You know, these people are, are in fact fit and, and proper persons. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Again, clause seven. Any comment? Fran, thank you. Okay. During then, clause eight. Financial stability requirement. Clause 8 sets out key elements of the second authorisation criterion set out in Clause 5, which requires the regulator to be satisfied that a master trust is financially sustainable. Under this requirement, the regulator must be satisfied that a master trust has a sound strategy for achieving financial sustainability. For example, the estimates and assumptions about the scheme's future viability on which the strategy is based must be robust. The regulator also needs to be satisfied that the Master Trust has sufficient financial resources to cover its running and set up costs, meet the cost of complying with duties arising under other provisions of the Bill to ensure protection and continuity for members and employers should a triggering event occur indicating a risk of scheme failure. And meet the costs of running following a triggering event for a period deemed appropriate by the regulator of between six months and two years. In assessing a scheme's financial sustainability, the regulator will take account of a number of factors which will be set out in regulations. For example, the details of the business strategy, the available financial resources as set out in the scheme's business plan, the scheme's annual accounts, scheme funders accounts and other supporting documents. Regulations may also, for example, prescribe that the regulator must take into consideration the risk of the scheme funders insolvency, whether the scheme funder is subject to any requirement by other regulatory regimes, the terms and repayment periods of any loan funding relied on to meet the scheme's running costs. That's cause eight. Okay. Anybody in the room, Clause 8? No? Okay. Andy, again, sorry. any comments? Sorry, sorry, sorry can I go back to Clause 7? Just uh, okay. for Kelly. Yeah, Kelly, uh, um, I, I, there is, a, um, if, you, if you look at I, it's a Clause 7 5, and right. I expect it actually sets out, you know, you know, is what we mean by the term connected persons. Yeah, that's a good idea. You know, an, an associate. Um, you know, a, a company director, shadow director, uh, or if you're being involved in the scheme as a, as a such trustee. It's okay, so it's in seven five. It's the associate of B that I was yeah, talking yeah. about. You know, it's, if it's normally that tends to be a, a, a you know from their business yeah. operations. Yeah. Though, 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 obviously, I think they probably would look at that whether or not they you know they're all coming from the same family uh, and whether or not they're all involved inside the business somehow or other. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, okay sorry, just to provide that clarification. That's fine. No, that's fine. That's grand. Okay, so we're on close eight still, and just ask Andy any comment on close eight. Grand, thank you. Okay, close nine then, Dorian. Financial Sustainability Requirement Business Plan. Clause 9 requires the scheme strategist of a master trust to prepare and maintain a scheme business plan as part of the financial sustainability criterion. The plan is to be submitted to the regulator with the application for authorisation and thereafter reviewed and, if appropriate, revised annually and following any significant change in agreement with the key parties involved in operating the scheme. This clause also contains a power that enables the department to prescribe further detailed requirements in regulations. The scheme strategist or trustees must submit the business plan 
and any supporting information or documents with the application for authorisation, and thereafter within three months of any revision of the plan or at the regulator's request. That's clause nine. Thank you, Dorian. Any members in the room? Clause nine. Robin? Yeah, can I just ask, Chair, in terms of the business plan, what's the process for approving the business plan? Just as the scheme strategist or the trustees must, pro or must provide the regulator with the most recent business plan, and the regulator would have the ability, obviously, to reject that business plan if it wasn't a, uh, a standard, but no standard is specified, Chair. Well, look, well, look again, uh, I and that will be left up to the pensions regulator. You, you know, when it's looking at, at the whole of, of the plan in, a, in its entirety, yeah, uh, and they will decide whether or not that they are content that it, uh, the actual business plan is one which is sound and which um, seems as if it, it should be viable as as they head into the future. So basically, it's being uh, being approved by the regulator. Yes, the, yes, yeah. I, I, uh, you know, and it's ultimately, but all all, all these documents have to be. And yeah. They go to the regulator, and they will be the ultimate one who will decide whether or not these are signed. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks, Robin. Can I, can I just further yep, to on. that then? Um, if the pension regulator is evaluating the effectiveness or the appropriateness of the business plan, it states here that the department may make regulations setting out and mm -hmm. gives the details. Does that not have to be then cleared by the pensions regulator before the department can set in regulation? No. Any of the details? No, 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 actually, but the function of uh, the pensions regulator is, is actually to carry out what is set down in, in law. So, for, for example, once you pass this bill, well, then I, you know, the pension regulator has to carry that out. Um, and certainly, once we make a set of regulations, but, you know, you know, but they have to follow it as well. And that, that could mean us breaking parity here with what happens elsewhere, say, for instance, in Westminster. Well, 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 only if we thought there was some very good reason why we would want to be doing something different. So I, I think that the evidence which you've gotten so far it seems to be that everybody thinks that we shouldn't be doing anything different. And certainly that is, is, is actually the view from the department as well, because we have schemes. I, well, well we, we, we have one which is based here, uh, which also has people here in England, Scotland, Wales. But, but we also have schemes which are based in England, for example, who will have members here. And therefore, but it makes sense for the two sets of law as such to be the same. Okay. Other, uh, and it's only when we start to diverge we could end up getting into trouble. But does that allow us to diverge? Um, in, in theory, yes. Uh, but but in, in, in theory, under the Northern Ireland Act, but, but we have the power to do what we wish. However, the problem is getting it to work. You're taking a big chance, Chair, if you were to diverge from... Yeah. 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 And I mean, as Jerry said, the pension regulator and the master trust that we had in books to brief us were, you know, more than content with this legislation. So I don't see that it will happen. But of yeah. course, who knows? No, that's okay. Members content then that we move on yeah. that, uh, with clause nine in the room. Yeah. Okay. Can I again then ask you, Andy? Are you content with clause nine or any comments? Yes, sure. Grant. Thank you. Okay. Then during clause ten. Scheme funder requirements. This clause sets out requirements that a scheme funder must meet. The clause requires a master trust scheme funder to be set up as a body corporate or a partnership that is a legal person under the law by which it is governed and for each scheme funder to only carry out activities that relate directly to the master trust or master trusts of which it is a scheme funder or prospective scheme funder. Regulations may prescribe exceptions for scheme funders that meet additional requirements in relation to their financial position and financial arrangements with the master trust or provide the regulator with specified information for it to be satisfied of the scheme's financial sustainability. Another regulation making power in this clause enables regulations to specify requirements about a scheme funder's accounts, for example, requiring them if not otherwise required, to be audited, including applying some or all of the provision in Parts 15 and 16 of the Companies Act 2006, with or without modification. That's it. Clause Thanks, 10. Doreen. Okay. Any members in the room? Any comments or contempt? Clause 10. Okay. Thank you. Andy, again. Any comments or contempt? Clause 10. Okay. Stop. Thank you. Okay. Then, Doreen, then we move on to Clause 11. 
systems and process <coughs> requirements. <coughs> this clause contains powers to make regulations to specify what aspects of the scheme's systems and processes used in running the scheme the regulator must take into account in deciding whether they are sufficient to ensure the scheme is run effectively. This clause lists what the regulations may include. For example, provision about record management and the standards, features and maintenance of the IT system, as well as the processes for the governance of the scheme, such as the appointment and removal of trustees and other people involved in the running of the scheme. The examples given are not exhaustive and regulations may include other matters relevant to systems and processes which are a key part of the new regime for Master Trust. That's Clause 11. Thank you. Okay, members again, any comments or content in the room? Clause 10. Okay, thank you. Andy, Clause 10, content? Thank you. Oh, sorry, that was Clause 11. Apologies, that was Clause 11. Sorry, I'll do that again, Andy. Content for Clause 11? Yes, Thank you. Okay, then we'll move on to Clause 12. <coughs> continuity strategy requirement. Clause 12 sets out the requirements in relation to the continuity strategy. The continuity strategy must set out how the interests of scheme members will be protected if the scheme experiences a triggering event and must make clear any administration charges. This clause covers the basis on which the regulator will make its decision about whether the scheme's strategy is adequate. The aim is to try to ensure there is continuity of pension saving for the members of a failing scheme. An adequate continuity strategy should demonstrate that the scheme has given careful thought and consideration to what it would do if it were at risk of failing. Regulations under this clause will set out that the strategy should include what actions the scheme will take to manage and protect members' assets. That's Clause 12. Thank you, Doreen. OK, members in the room, any comments or content on Clause 12? OK, thank you. Um, Andy, again, Sorry, sorry, I, just sorry. There, I, I, it's one of the things which we will be setting out is also as, as to how the M scheme has to keep it in, in, as it were, full touch with their membership I, and for all these things so that they are actually kept fully informed. Of um, and a, and a thing which is actually going on here. Okay, so that's an important criteria w which we will be setting down. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Um, sorry, Andy again, close twelve. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Andy, sorry, close twelve. Thank you. Okay, close thirteen. Ongoing supervision of master trust schemes, clauses thirteen to nineteen. Clause 13 requires the regulator to maintain and publish a list of authorised master trust schemes, identifying the scheme by name and providing any other appropriate information. That's Clause 13. Okay, thank you. Again, Clause 13, members in the room, content? Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. Andy again, Clause 13, content? Thank you. Okay, Doreen, then, Clause 14. Requirement to submit annual accounts. Clause 14 requires the trustees and scheme funders of authorised master trusts to send the scheme accounts and scheme funders' annual accounts to the regulator each year. This is critical to the regulator's ongoing financial supervision of the scheme. Also, it enables the regulator to risk assess the solvency of the scheme funder. The clause also provides that the regulator may issue a civil penalty for non-compliance with these requirements. That's clause 14. Okay, again, members in the room, clause 14. <coughs> Any comments? Are you content? Content? Andy, um, clause 14, you content? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, can I just add a, you know, for something which was asked earlier? I answer the scheme funders' accounts must be submitted no later than I, uh, to nine months so okay, after the end. Yeah. yeah. Of, 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 of the actual year to which they relate, or, or uh, indeed any other period which is set down by regulations. Should cover them now. Okay, First thank year. you. And Dory, move on to Clause 15. Requirement to submit supervisory return. Clause 15 provides that the regulator may require the trustees of an authorised master trust scheme to submit a supervisory return. This follows on from the the Clause 14 requirement on trustees and scheme funders of master trust schemes to submit the schemes and scheme funders' annual accounts. If the regulator requires further information to ensure that it is satisfied that the master trust scheme continues to meet the authorisation criteria, it can require the trustees to provide that information in the supervisory return by notice in writing. 
This notice must specify the information required to be included in the return, the manner and form in which the return must be submitted, and the time period within which it must be submitted. In recognition of the fact that this requirement means additional work for trustees, the clause provides that a supervisory return can only be requested once in any 12-month period and that trustees must be given at least 28 days to compile and submit the return. The clause includes a regulation making power to allow the Department to specify the information which may be requested through such a return. The clause also allows the regulator to apply a civil penalty to a trustee who fails to submit a supervisory return when required to do so. I, and again, can I add one, one more bit of information? One of the things which will be setting down in law is that they will have to tell us as, as to how the scheme trustees are each year making sure that they are staying up to date with what the law says and, and as to what their duties are, etc. Okay, so the trustees' competence shall form part of this, which they would have to provide information on. Okay, thank you. All right, members in the room, Clause 15, any comments? Are you content? Content. Yeah. Andy, Clause 15, content? <coughs> Thank you. Okay, then we'll move on to clause 16. Duty to notify regulator of significant events. This clause provides the regulator. Sorry, this clause provides that the regulator must be notified in writing if significant events occur in relation to an authorised master trust scheme. The clause also contains a regulation making power that allows the department to specify in regulations what constitutes significant events. The intention is that the list of significant events will capture events which could affect the ability of an authorised master trust scheme to continue meeting the authorisation criteria. The clause sets out who will be subject to the reporting duty and that the regulator may issue a penalty if they fail to comply. It does not require persons to disclose anything which is covered by legal professional privilege. That's clause 16. Thank you. Okay, members in the room, clause 16, any comments? You content? Content. Okay, um, Andy, clause 16, content? Thank you. Okay, then we'll move on to clause 17. Six penalty notice for failure to comply with request for information. Clause 17 gives the regulator the power to impose a fixed penalty on any person who fails to comply with a request under Article 67 in relation to its master trust functions. The penalty will be determined by regulations made by the Department and must not exceed £50,000. It should be noted that clauses 14 to 16 of the Bill make provision requiring authorised schemes to submit information to the regulator on a regular basis, as well as providing that significant events must be reported and allowing the regulator to request further information through supervisory returns. In addition to this, the regulator is able to request information which relates to its functions from the pension schemes which it regulates. This is set out in Article 67 of the Pensions NI Order 2005. It's Clause 70. Okay, thank you, Lorraine. Okay, members in the room, any comment or content with Clause 17? Content. Yeah, thank you. Andy, Clause 17, content? <coughs> thank you. Okay, then we'll move on to Clause 18. Escalating penalty notice for failure to comply with requests for information. Clause 18 gives the, the pensions regulator the power to issue an escalating penalty notice to any person who fails to comply with the request for information under Article 67 of the Pensions NI Order 2005 in relation to its Master Trust authorisation functions. This is in addition to the provision in Clause 17, which gives the regulator power to issue a fixed penalty notice under Article 67 of that order. An escalating penalty will be calculated by reference to a daily rate set out in regulations made by the Department, which must not exceed £10,000 per day. An escalating penalty may be more appropriate in some circumstances, for example, when an urgent request for time-sensitive information is delayed. Issuing an escalating penalty notice would mean that taking additional time to submit the information would incur a greater penalty. That's close yet. I, and so the intention is that on, on day one the penalty would be I, 
uh, and so one thousand on day two, it's a double two, uh, two thousand and three thousand, four thousand, five thousand. So after day ten, the actual penalty would be until uh, um, okay, fifty-five thousand. For each day after that, it would it would also go a bit further uh, uh, to ten thousand <coughs> okay, per day. For each day after, that. Uh, okay, that's just to give you some idea of what we're talking about. But but these would only be used where somebody you know, you know actually really isn't helping out at all, uh, and they actually aren't handing over the information. Uh, like the pension regulator is actually worried about what's going on. Okay, so these are quite strong partners. Grant, thank you. Try for that. And Doreen, um, okay, members in the room, clause 18, any comment or content to note that one as well? Content. Content, that's grand. Um, Andy, are you content? Yeah, sure. And I can't, don't even, my screen's gone a bit strange here, so I don't even know if Mark is content or not because I can't see any hands up or hands down, so he is content. Yeah, okay. That's fine. Okay, then we'll move on to Clause 19. Withdrawal of authorisation. Clause 19 gives the regulator the ability to withdraw a Master Trust scheme's authorisation if it stops being satisfied that the scheme meets the authorisation criteria. It must, it must issue a warning notice, standard procedure, or where there is immediate risk to members' interests, must issue a determination notice, special procedure. The issue of such a notice is a triggering event. This clause is fundamental to the Bill. Without it, there would be no consequences for a scheme which becomes authorised and then lets standards slip, or where events occur that materially impact whether the regulator remains satisfied that the authorisation criteria continue to be met. The regulator seeks to support and assist those involved in running pension schemes before it moves to sanction them. The process for withdrawing authorisation will be no different. The regulator will work with master trust schemes and it will support them so that once they are authorised and operating, they remain well run. However, if an authorised scheme no longer satisfies the regulator that it has met, that it has met or continues to meet the authorisation criteria, the regulator must have the power to withdraw authorisation. That's clause 19. Okay, thank you. Okay, members in the room, clause 19. Content, or any comments? Okay, content. Andy, content with clause 19? Content, Mark, again, if you can put a thumbs up or thumbs down, you're content. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, then we'll go on during to clause 20. Triggering, triggering events, continuity, clauses 20 to 33. Clause 20 is the first of a number of clauses that cover what happens when a master trust experiences a triggering event. A triggering event is an event that could put a master trust scheme's future at risk. The clause sets out the requirements which trustees must comply with following a triggering event, that they must comply with the requirements set out in clauses 22, 23 and 26, broadly that the trustees have to Notify the regulator of the triggering event. Decide which continuity option they are going to pursue where they have a choice. And prepare and secure the regulator's approval of an implementation strategy which sets out how the interests of the scheme members are to be protected. That's clause 20. Okay, again, members in the room, any comments or consent with clause 20? Okay, thank you. Andy, are you content with clause 20? Okay, Mark, thumbs up for clause 20 or down. Thumbs up, Grant, thank you. Okay, then Doreen, clause 21. Triggering events. Clause 21 sets out what the triggering events are and when the triggering event period is taken to start and finish. It contains a table with the 10 triggering events and the dates on which each event is taken to occur. Triggering events are key risk events that may arise in the life cycle of a master trust scheme and the authorisation regime. They reflect the different structures and circumstances of these types of schemes compared to more traditional employer-sponsored occupational schemes. This clause sets out that a triggering event period starts from the date on which the triggering event occurred. This is to ensure that members and employers have greater protection from that point. It provides that this period lasts until the scheme is wound up or continuity option one applies, the point where the trustees receive notification from the regulator that it is satisfied the triggering, of, triggering event has been resolved where continuity option two applies, 
or it becomes clear that authorisation will not be withdrawn as Clause 21. Okay, thank you, Dorian. Clause 21. Members in the room, any comments? Are you content with Clause 21? Content. Content. Andy, are you content with Clause 21? Manager. Okay, you have Mark's thumb up. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to Clause 22. Notification requirements. Clause 22 concerns the notification of the triggering events that are set out in Clause 21. This clause places a duty on specific individuals to notify the regulator when a triggering event occurs. It covers both the person to whom the triggering event has happened or who has made a certain decision and also the other persons involved with the scheme. This is to provide additional reassurance that the regulator will be informed of events that could put a master trust at risk of failing. The clause also includes a regulation making power to set a time frame by which notifications must be made and to set any further information requirements that must be disclosed as part of the notification process. A civil penalty under Article 10 of the Pensions NI Order 1995 applies where a person fails to comply with the notification requirements under this clause. That's Clause 22. Thank you. Okay, members in the room, content with Clause 22 or any comments? No, nope. content. Andy, clause 22, you content? Sure. Okay, Mark, content? Grant, thank you. Is that content? Yeah, I think it was. Okay, then we'll move on to clause 23. Um, Doreen, please. Continuity options. Clause 23 sets out the two continuity options which must be pursued by the trustees where a master trust has experienced a triggering event. Continuity option one requires the scheme to transfer out all members' accrued rights and benefits and then wind up. Continuity option two is for the scheme to resolve its triggering event to the satisfaction of the regulator. Trustees will generally have a choice over which continuity option they pursue. However, when the regulator's decision to withdraw authorisation has become final or there is a notification that the scheme is not authorised, Trustees must pursue continuity option one. This is because the scheme poses a level of risk to members and employers, which means that it cannot be permitted to continue. A civil penalty under, under Article 10 of the Pensions NI Order 1995 applies where a person fails to comply with the requirements of the clause. That's Clause 23. Thank you. Clause 23, members in the room. Content or any comments? Content. Andy, content with Clause 23? Mark, content. Thank you. OK, we'll move on then to Clause 24. Continuity, option one, transfer out and winding up. Clause 24 sets out a framework for the transfer out and winding up process. It also includes regulation making powers to describe the detailed arrangements and timings for this process. To this end, subsection 1 requires that the trustees of the scheme must identify an alternative pension scheme to which members' rights and benefits can be transferred and must notify both members and employers of the proposed changes in the manner specified in regulations made under subsection 2. Subsections 3 and 4 set out the matters for which provision <coughs> must be made in regulations to enable a smooth transfer and wind-up of the scheme. Members may choose to have their accrued rights and benefits transferred to a different scheme. The provisions in Clause 24 will enable <coughs> members of schemes that are subject to continuity option 1 to continue to save and their employers to maintain their compliance with automatic enrolment duties where appropriate with as little disruption as possible. A penalty under Article 10 of the Pensions NI Order 1995 applies to anyone who fails to comply with any requirement imposed by this clause and the regulations may also make <coughs> for the application of Article 10. That's Clause 24. Okay, members in the room, Clause 24, all content? Yep. Okay. Andy, content with Clause 24? And Mark's given me the thumbs up as well, so that's grand. Then we'll move on then to Clause 25. Continuity Option 2, Resolving Triggering Event. This clause sets out the framework where the scheme is pursuing Continuity Option 2. This is where trustees have decided to try to resolve the triggering, triggering event the scheme has experienced and to continue on. 
The trustees must notify the regulator when they consider that the triggering event has been resolved, setting out how they consider that this has been achieved. Having considered this, the regulator has to notify the trustees whether it is satisfied that the event has been resolved. The regulator can only form the view that a triggering event has been resolved if it is satisfied that any other triggering event which has occurred to the scheme since the occurrence of the original triggering event has also been resolved. The aim is that where the trustees decide to try to resolve the triggering event, they have the opportunity to do so, so that the scheme can continue and the members can continue to save in the scheme with as little disruption as possible. Where a trustee fails to comply with the requirement imposed by this clause, a penalty under Article 10 of the Pensions NI Order 1995 applies. That's Clause 25. Thank you. OK, members, Clause 25 in the room. Any comments or content? OK, all content. Andy, Clause 25, are you content? Yeah, sure. Mark? Yep, content. OK, we'll move on then to Clause 26. Approval of Implementation Strategy. This clause sets out the duty on the trustees to submit an implementation strategy to the pensions regulator where a tri triggering event occurs. An implementation strategy is a document setting out how the interests of members are to be protected following the occurrence of the triggering event. The regulator can only approve the implementation strategy if it is satisfied it is adequate. Where necessary, the regulator has the power to direct trustees to follow the approved implementation strategy. An adequate strategy should demonstrate that the scheme has carefully thought through the actions it needs to take, the tasks it needs to complete, who is responsible for these, the deadlines it needs to meet, and so on. More detailed requirements about the information that must be contained in the strategy will be set out in regulations. The intention is that these will cover the key activities for either resolving the triggering event under continuity option two, or the key tasks and administration in preparation for a transfer or as part of a wind up under continuity option one. Where a person fails to comply with the direction to comply with this clause, a civil penalty under Article 10 of the Pensions NI Order 1995 applies. That's clause 26. Okay, clause 26, members in the room, content or any comments? Content. Nope. Okay, Andy, clause 26, content? Content. Mark, clause 26, content? Yep, okay. Clause 27, then, Dorian. Content of implementation strategy. This clause sets out what the implementation strategy must contain in order to demonstrate to the regulator that the strategy is adequate. It requires that the implementation strategy includes a section setting out the levels of administration charges that applied in relation to members. The details of how this should be done will be set out in regulations. The regulation making power provides the flexibility to add to the requirements for the implementation strategy. This clause also requires that the strategy includes information about the continuity option that is being pursued subject to which of the two continuity options is being followed. The clause provides for further requirements to include details of transfer arrangements that the scheme plans to pursue or of how the scheme proposes to resolve the triggering event. It's clause 27. Okay, members in the room, clause 27. Sorry, Gary, you want to add? I, that's once again, one of the very important things would be that it shows up set out as, as to how they will speak to members about this and to make sure the membership are, are actually kept fully informed of what's going on here. And that's one of the things which we will be setting down in law as well. Okay, all right, thanks a lot, Jerry. Okay, members in the room, close 27, content or any comments? Content, okay. good stuff. Andy, close 27, content? Content, sure. Aunt Mark, close 27, content, yep, okay. We'll then move to close 28. Duty to pursue continuity option. Clause 28 requires the trustees to pursue the continuity option they have set out in their implementation strategy once the regulator has approved the strategy. It requires the trustees to undertake the steps they have identified as being needed in the strategy. Where they don't follow the strategy, the regulator has the power to direct the trustees to do so. The trustees also have to make the strategy available to the employers participating in the scheme. 
a penalty for failure to comply under Article 10 of the Pensions NI Order 1995 applies to anyone who fails to comply with the direction made by the regulator. That's Clause 28. Members, Clause 28 in the room. Any comments or content? Content. content thank you. Andy, Clause 28, are you content? Content, sir. Are content? Okay, thank you. We'll move on then to Clause 29. Prohibition on winding up except in accordance with Continuity Option 1. This clause provides that Mustard Trusts can only be wound up in accordance with Continuity Option 1. In conjunction with other clauses of the Bill, this clause ensures that the wind-up of a scheme is carefully managed and overseen by the regulator, to whom the scheme will have to report regularly under Clause 30. Where a person fails to comply with Subsection 1, a penalty under Article 10 of the Pensions NI Order 1995 applies. It's Clause 29. Okay. Members in the room, first of all, Clause 29. Um, any comment or content to note? Content. Content of that. Okay, Andy, Clause 29, are you content? Content, sir. Mark, again, content? Okay, thank you. We'll move on then to Clause 30. Periodic reporting requirement. Clause 30 requires that during a triggering event period, the trustees of a master trust must submit periodic reports to the regulator. These reports must contain information on the scheme's progress against its implementation strategy record relevant events or decisions and provide such other information as will be set out in regulations. The length and content of these reports will depend on the particular scheme and its circumstances. A penalty for failure to comply under Article 10 of the Pensions NI Order 1995 applies to a person who fails to follow the reporting requirements imposed by this clause. It's clause 30. Okay, thank you, Doreen. Um, first of all, members in the room, clause 30, any comments or you consent? Content. Andy, clause 30, you content? Content, Mark, clause 30, content? Content. Thank you. Okay, then we'll move on to clause 31. Pause orders. Clause 31 makes provision for pause orders and introduces Schedule 1, which makes additional detailed provision. A pause order will allow the regulator to pause a range of activities within a master trust scheme if that scheme is in a triggering event period. Directions which a pause order may make include preventing new members being admitted to the scheme, prohibiting further contributions or payments into the scheme, prohibiting transfers out of the scheme, etc. To make a pause order, the regulator must be satisfied that making a pause order will help the trustees to carry out the implementation strategy or that there is an immediate risk to members' interests or scheme assets, and it is necessary to make a pause order to protect the members' interests. Schedule 1 gives more detail about pause orders. It voids any action that is taken in contravention of the pause order and sets out the position when certain directions are made. It clarifies the arrangements for pension sharing on divorce. It sets out the time limits for pause orders and requires various notifications. It allows the regulator to validate action taken in contravention of the pause order, for example, by the trustees. Pause orders will enable the regulator to act effectively under the new authorisation and supervisory regime when it can see that the interests of savers in master trust schemes are at risk. That's clause 31. Okay, thank you, Doreen. Um, members in the room, clause 31, content or any comments? Content. Um, Andy, clause 31, are you content? Content. Mark, content with clause 31? Content. content. Thank you. Um, Doreen, clause 32. Prohibition on new employers during triggering event. Clause 32 provides that when a master trust is in a triggering event period, it may not take on new employers to pursue to participate in the scheme. This is to prevent significantly more members being added to the scheme, possibly exposing them to risks and adding to the risks already being experienced by the scheme. Also, it cannot enter into an agreement during the triggering event period to take on new employers after that period has ended. Employers that are currently using the scheme for their employees can continue to use it and if they have new employees, they can join the scheme. 
The clause also allows the pensions regulator to apply a civil penalty to a person who fails to comply with subsection 1 when required to do so. That's clause 32. Thank you, Doreen. Okay, members in the room, clause 32. Any comments are content to proceed? Okay, that's fine. Andy, any comments in clause 32? You're content? Mark again, clause 32. Any comments? Okay, thank you. Clause 33 then? Prohibition on increasing charges, etc., during triggering event period. Clause 33 provides for a prohibition in relation to members' charges during a triggering event period. The trustees must not increase charges above levels set out in the implementation strategy, introduce new charges on members, or impose charges as a consequence of a member leaving or deciding to leave the scheme during the triggering event period. Regulations under this clause set out how the charge levels in the implementation strategy are to be calculated. The aim is that members should not pay more during a triggering event period than they did previously. This clause also restricts the charges which can be imposed by a master trust proposed by trustees or employers to receive members under continuity option one. The aim is to prevent pension pots being depleted by additional charges. Such a receiving scheme is prevented from increasing charges above the levels set out in a statement it must provide to the regulator before a transfer or from imposing new charges to meet the costs which were incurred by the transferring scheme or relate directly to the transfer. This clause provides that members continue to pay charges at the levels which applied when their scheme was running normally so they do not have to pay for the costs the scheme is incurring because it has experienced a triggering event. The aim is to protect members' pots and help to maintain their value. A civil penalty under Article 10 of the Pensions NI Order 1995 applies to a trustee who fails to comply with the prohibition. That's Clause 33. Thank you. During Clause 33, Robin, you had something you wanted to ask? Uh, yeah, Chair, can I just ask... Uh Charges could have been or may have been a triggering event. Would that be right? I, uh, and so the charges themselves would normally be? Yes. Um, I, I, and so what we, or, or, what, or, or how this will work, is that they will look back and see as to what the charges would have been normally. <coughs> um, I, the reason is to make sure that, that, that you don't have a scheme which actually knew that it was about to have one of these triggering events and had ha, ha, like, therefore put up the charges. You know, and so we'll look back to see over a, a, a such period of time as to what the charges um, should have been normally, uh, and uh, uh, and the, the um, scheme isn't going to be able to charge any, any, anything more than that. I say that is to avoid a scheme actually putting up the charges, such just before this event occurs, and therefore being able to get more money out of the members, and, and therefore the members' pots being cut. Okay. Robin, did that answer you? Yeah, I think so. Just for clarification. If, charge, if charges can be a triggering event, mm -hmm. and during the period of the triggering, can those charges continue to apply then? Uh, sorry, sorry I, I, I just have to come back to you on the, that, that point about the charges. I'm not entirely okay, clear on that point, but I'll certainly look at it. That's uh, fine, sure. back. That's fine. All right, then, no other comments on Clause 33, then, from the room? Other than that, then, are we content? Yeah? Yes, people? No, OK, Mark's content. Andy, are you content as well, Clause 33? Um, can I just remind you, Mark, to turn your um, mute button on in between? <laughs> Thank you. OK, Clause 34, Doreen. Decisions on withdrawal of authorisation timing, clauses 34 and 35. Clauses 34 and 35 operate together, so if you're content, I will deal with them together. Clauses set out the procedure to determine when it becomes clear that a scheme's authorisation will not be withdrawn by the pensions regulator or a decision to withdraw authorisation becomes final. Clause 21 includes a table of triggering events the first two items on that table are the regulator issues a warning notice under the standard procedure in respect of a decision to withdraw the scheme's authorisation 
and the regulator issues a determination notice under the special procedure in respect of the decision to withdraw the scheme's authorisation. Should such events occur in relation to an authorised master trust scheme, the scheme will be required to follow continuity option one. This involves transferring members out of the scheme and commencing wind-up. However, schemes will have the opportunity to appeal by way of a referral to a tribunal. If a scheme makes such a referral, and also if it makes any subsequent appeal of the tribunal's determination, it will not be required to follow the process set out within continuity option one until the outcome of any appeal process is known and the decision to withdraw authorisation becomes final under clause 35. Clause 35 makes provision based on various factual scenarios for the date on which a decision to withdraw authorisation becomes final. Clause 34 sets out the date on which it becomes clear that authorisation will not be withdrawn from a master trust. This is relevant for working out when a triggering event period ends under Clause 21. That's Clauses 34 and 35. Okay, members in the room, clauses 34 and 35, any comments or content? Content. Content. Um, Andy, clause 34, 35, content? Content. Mark, clause 34, 35, content? Content. Thank you very much. Okay, then we'll move on to clause 36. Supplementary, clauses 36 to 40. Broad compensation. This clause allows the Department to make regulations which modify the provisions on fraud compensation in the Pensions NI Order 2005, so as to make the fraud compensation arrangements more applicable to master trusts and to any other occupational schemes to which some or all of the provisions of Part 1 of the Bill apply. At present, fraud compensation payments can be made to occupational pension schemes where certain conditions are met. These conditions include that the value of the scheme's assets has been reduced and there are reasonable grounds for believing this was due to dishonesty. In addition, there is an insolvency requirement in relation to the scheme's participating employers. As master trusts are used or intended to be used by multiple employers who do not need to have a connection to each other, they would likely have difficulty meeting the current condition on employer insolvency. Therefore, the intention is to remove this requirement for master trusts and to add other conditions to make fraud compensation more suitable for these types of schemes. The intention is to use the regulation making powers under Clause 40 to apply some or all of the provisions of Part 1 to other types of occupational pension schemes. These would be schemes to which the master trust regime will be extended. That's Clause 36. Okay, in the room again, clause 36, content, or any comment? Content, yes. Content. Okay, Andy, clause 36, content. Content, Mark, clause 36, content. Content, yeah. Thank you. Okay, then, clause 37 and schedule 2. Master trusts in operation and commencement, transitional provision. Clause 37 introduces schedule 2. This schedule modifies parts of the bill in relation to how it applies to existing master trusts. It ensures that the measures in the bill apply to existing master trusts appropriately by allowing for transitional arrangements and an application process for current schemes that were in, in existence before the commencement date. The commencement date is defined by reference to the commencement of Clause 3, that is, the prohibition on operation of a master trust without authorisation. It protects members and employers where a master trust, which is already operating, as a triggering event before the regime as a whole comes into operation. The modifications are designed to allow a master trust to continue to operate until its application is received by the regulator or the regulator determines that the scheme should not be authorised. It also provides that the trustees of a master trust scheme must, within the six month application period, either apply for authorisation or decide to wind up the scheme. That's clause 37. Okay, members. I, um, so can I just add a point to that? I, I, I'd have to say that the provisions are, are actually ones which we don't think we, we shall ever have to use, in the sense we only have the one scheme which we're However, but we have them in, okay, just in case there is um, some scheme out there which we haven't picked up on. 
Okay, it means that they would be caught by the law, so they couldn't avoid the law by us not including this. Okay, that's why it's there. Okay, thank you. All right, members in the room, clause 37. Are we content then with that as well? Ten. Yes? Ten. Yep, okay. Andy, clause 37. Ten. And Mark, clause 37. Good stuff. Okay, then we'll move on to clause 38 and schedule 3. Minor and consequential amendments. Clause 38 relates to minor and consequential amendments to existing legislation. Firstly, it introduces Schedule 3 to the Bill, which makes minor and consequential amendments to existing legislation. Secondly, it contains a regulation-making power to make further consequential amendments to other legislation. That's Clause 38. Okay. Um, clause 38. I hadn't ticked it off there. Okay, members in the room, Clause 38 and Schedule 3, content? Content. Okay, Andy, Clause 38, Schedule 3? Sure. And again, Mark, Clause 38 and Schedule 3? Content. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, then we'll move on to Clause 39. Interpretation of Part 1. Clause 39 contains a variety of provisions. Definitions, modifications for mixed benefit schemes and a regulation making power that enables the department to treat persons as being or not being scheme funders, whether or not they fall within the definition in the bill. That's clause 39. Brilliant. Okay. Members in the room, clause 39, content or any comments? Content. Content. Andy, clause 39, content? Content, yeah. Mark, clause 39, content. Content, yeah. Thank you. Okay, then we'll move on to clause 40. Clause 40 makes provision to make regulations to modify the way in which Part 1 of the Bill is applied. Master trusts are a recent development in a pensions landscape which continues to evolve. In order to ensure the right schemes are in scope, it is necessary to have some flexibility in the application of the authorisation regime. Clause 40 makes provision for regulations to apply some or all of the provisions in Part 1 to not sorry, to non-master trust pension schemes with certain characteristics. Such regulations can also disapply some or all of the provisions in part one to master trusts with certain characteristics. This is intended to ensure that the requirement for authorisation applies in a proportionate way. The provisions in this clause also allow for regulations to provide for two or more pension schemes to be treated as a single master trust scheme in certain circumstances. These circumstances include, but are not limited to, schemes being under common control, subject to common rules, or schemes provided by the same provider. That's clause 40. Brilliant. Okay, members in the room, clause 40, any comments? Are you content? Content. Content. Andy, clause 40, any comments or content? Sure. Okay, Aunt Mark, close 40. Any comments or content? Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, we'll move on then to close 41. Part 2, Administration Charges, Power to Override Contract Terms. This clause amends the Pensions Act Northern Ireland 2015 to allow regulations to be made that enable a term of a relevant contract to be overridden to the extent that it conflicts with the provision in those regulations. The power would only allow a contract to be overridden where there is a conflict with a provision in regulations, and this ensures that relevant contracts are consistent with the regulations and provides certainty to the parties involved. The intention is that Clause 41 will be used alongside existing powers in the Pensions Act Northern Ireland 2015 to make regulations to, for example, cap early exit charges. Early exit charges are any administration charges which are paid by a member for leaving their pension scheme early when they are eligible to access the pension freedoms, which they would not face at their normal retirement date. It will also be used to override contractual terms which conflict with the ban on member born commission arising under existing contracts in certain occupational pension schemes. Contracts in this context means a contract between a trustee or manager and a person who provides administrative services to the scheme, which permits the person to impose the member born commission charge. This will complete the ban that already exists for member born commission arising under agreements entered into on or after the 6th of April 2016. 
clause 41. Okay, thank you. Brilliant. Okay, members in the room, um, clause 41, any comments or content? Content. Content. Andy, clause 41, are you content? Gotcha. Aunt Mark, clause 41, are you content? <coughs> Thank you. I know members would said we would stop this um, at sort of five to one o'clock, but I think we're modern three. I think we could get it finished okay. So I'm going to move on then during the clause 42. This is part three, general in the bill. Clause 42 makes further provision about the regulation making powers in the bill and the procedures for exercising those powers. It allows for the inclusion of incidental, supplementary, consequential, transitional, transitory or saving provisions. That's clause 42. Okay, brilliant. Okay, members in the room, content with clause 42? Content. Yep. Yeah. Okay, Andy, clause 42, content? Yeah. Uh, Mark, clause 42, content? Yeah, I think that was content. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, we'll move on to clause 43. Clause 43 sets out the definitions of key terms used throughout the bill. That's clause 43. Okay, members, content with 43? Content. Okay, um, Andy, 43, content? Yeah. I'm Mark, 43, content? Content as well, Chair, and apologies, Chair. I'm going to have to knock out for about 10 minutes. Okay, of, of no problem. Could they use, but I've been content with everything so far, and there's nothing I see coming down the line <laughs> that has alarm bells ringing. Okay, thank you, Mark. All right, um, we'll move on then to Clause 44. Clause 44 provides for the commencement of the provisions within the Bill. The majority of clauses in the Bill will be commenced by order. However, there are some clauses in the Bill which will come into operation on the day after Royal Assent. Insofar as Master Trusts are concerned, these include provisions concerning the definition of a Master Trust scheme and provisions relating to Master Trusts in operation before the regime is fully commenced, including the triggering events and prohibition on increasing charges, certain information powers, penalty notice powers and interpretation. The power to override contracts to the extent that they conflict with provisions of regulations to restrict charges or impose requirements and schemes, and part three concerning general aspects of the bill, will also come into operation on the day after Royal Assent. And that's clause 44. Okay, thank you again, Doreen. Okay, members in the room, clause 44, content? Content. Okay, and then Andy, clause 44, content? And Mark's still there, so I assume he's content. Yeah, content yeah. <laughs> okay, but then finally we'll move on, clause 45, a short title. Finally, clause 45 simply establishes the short title of the bill. And that's clause 45. Thank you. And I assume then members in the room are content with clause 45. <laughs> yeah, okay. And the clause 45, yes? Okay, and Mark, clause 45. I always wonder why that one doesn't come at the first. I know, part. I know. Okay, members, just to inform you then, following on from our discussions, really good that we got that finished um, today. That's great. Um, that the final departmental response to the committee's discussion on the bill will be available for consideration at our next meeting and that the committee is due to formally read the clause by clause consideration into the record on either the 5th or the 12th of November. So thank you. Gary, and sorry, you. sorry, can I just clarify from Robin here can. the point about the charges again? Yeah. yeah. I just want to make sure that I understand. I, if the charges in, in themselves couldn't, I think one of the sorts of triggering, events and charge changes wouldn't be caught by that. Because I uh, for there, I basically count under on, under law. I suppose uh, zero point seven five. Yeah, you know, it was they and in, in themselves wouldn't be an, an event. Okay, so so there, there there can't be charges applied. That would be a triggering event then. No, no, no. They can't. Cause they're covered by elsewhere, which tells you that they have to be inside the cap. Okay. Okay. I'm okay, content, sir. <laughs> All right. Okay, Jerry Dorian. Thank you. Okay. Thank cheers. Thanks very much. much. And we'll see you then uh, when we come back after recess. Okay, cheers. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, members, I'm going to move on then to agenda item seven, which is draft committee report on additional legislative consent memorandum on the Westminster Pensions Bill. Members have been provided in your table papers with a copy of the actual legislative consent motion that will be debated in plenary um, in coming weeks. Can I, uh, members, the draft report is at 191 of your, of your pack? Can I ask any comments or are they content um, to order the report be printed? 
Content. Content. Yeah, thank you. We'll move on then to agenda item eight, which is SL1 fines, deductions from benefits regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Members, the SL1 is at page 205. Um, this was originally considered at the meeting on the 30th of September when the committee requested to know whether the payment of the fine or the loan um, takes precedence. The department replies at page 201, and that states that it is very much dependent on individual claimant circumstances and that the decision as to which debt would take priority would be based on the current total amount of deductions being taken from the benefit, um, if any, and the number of deductions already in place, if any, and ability to repay. Uh, the priority order for debt recovery only takes effect if there is insufficient benefit standard allowance to allow for payments of all liabilities, then a decision is made on a case-by-case -case basis regarding which debts should take precedence. The FC can reject the application from the uh, Department of Justice but consideration must be given to the possible ramifications of the claimant of DFC rejecting a court order. Um, members, are they content with that? Uh, are content that the department proceed to make the rule? Yeah. Yeah, content? Okay, thank you. Can we then move on to agenda item nine, which is correspondence. Correspondence memo is at page 210 of your meeting pack. Um, can I uh, firstly draw members' attention to page 215, which is a request from Peter Corey to brief the committee on the impact of COVID-19 on the arts sector? Um, can I ask our members' <coughs> content that we invite Mr Corey to come in and brief a future meeting? Yes? Agreed. Yep. Okay. I also want to draw members' attention to page 219 of a correspondence, which is correspondence from CO3, highlighting a survey to help understand the impact of COVID-19 is having on the third sector six months on. CO3 highlight that the survey results illustrate the profound impact on the sector and underline the need for continued tailor support of the sector. CO3 also highlight that the survey was issued prior to the release of the Department for Communities Social Enterprise Fund and the details of the job support scheme. Um, they are also calling for the reopening of the DSA charity fund to ensure that the six million underspend is protected for those charities who have lost their income due to COVID-19. Um, and we know from uh, speaking, and I certainly know from speaking to CO3 in the past, that there were charities that didn't apply under that scheme because they had sufficient funds and felt that it was only right that it went to those that were most in need. But now with furlough ending, um, some of those charities are finding themselves in, in a cliff edge position, as well as the charities that did get money um, and find themselves in difficulty. And I think the worry is there this six million, um, they would like to see that reopened again um, in order for the charities to avail on that. So, I mean, I suppose, um, uh, I know the, our correspondence memo says that we should support that, which I absolutely support. And, and calling for the minister to reopen that again. But I do think it would also maybe be um, a good idea. We haven't had the CO3 or NICFA or some of the charities, maybe even that did get money or didn't get money in. Uh, we haven't had them in in a little while. And I think it's maybe time we had another update or a briefing from them um, early whenever we come back after recess. So just members on that issue, um, are they content with that or any comment they want to make on that, Kelly? I was going to say, could we actually write to the department and ask, is it six million underspend? I know it's CO3 telling us that, but also could we also write to, I believe it's Department of Finance, about the dormant accounts that they mention? Yeah. Because there hasn't been any talk of that for quite some time, and I know that um, Department of Finance have considered several different ways of using dormant accounts, all within community and voluntary sector, social enterprise, but... If the money's sitting there and we have organisations that we need to support society, then let's get it out to them. But I just wanted to double check. There's six million underspend there. I don't know whether that actually is correct or not. Um, we don't want to disappoint people by saying that there's six million pounds when there actually isn't. Um, of course, we haven't seen the October monitoring round bill papers yet, but I think it would be good to put those two letters in. Okay, well, there's an agreement that we go and ask about that. Is that of six million in actual figure, and also the Department of Finance around the yeah. dormant accounts? And are our members content then that we invite the community and voluntary sector back in to give us a briefing? And just, I mean, some of them will, I, I can imagine that the money that has gone out, and there has been a substantial amount has gone out, has made a big difference. Um, for many charities, um, but we know that this uh, situation is not ready to stop now. It's going to continue into the future, so there needs to be some sort of planning put in place for that. So happy enough that we do that. Um, Andy, I'm sorry I didn't come in to you on a couple of those things there. 
So that's me finished for correspondence. Um, so I'm going to go and ask you first of you anything in correspondence or anything I've mentioned so far you want to comment on? No, Chair, just, just can I declare an interest as a tally trustee in respect to that item uh, just discussed and, and totally agree with Kelly, uh, which is outlined. Okay, that's grand, thank you, Andy. Okay, members in the room, anything on the correspondence memo they uh, want to highlight or anything else to do with that, Kelly? Um, it's just to go to page 242, the events and live music funding. Um, it talks about the second page, the Minister's intention that this funding should be issued at the earliest opportunity. Um, details on the new funding schemes, including guidance, you know, should be issued to or announced to us very shortly. Uh, if we could get the criteria for that. I appreciate that the letter was only written on the 19th of October, but it would be useful um, if we could get that. I'm also at the very la or the on that page 243, um, there's with limited funding available, it's likely that this will be restricted to those, including commercial sector, whose primary role is to create, pre present or support predefined sectoral ca categories. I don't know what that means. If we get clarification on that. Okay, fair point. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Kelly. Any other members in the room? Anything on correspondence? No? Okay, then. We will then move on to... Agenda item 10, which is forward work programme. Can I just inform you, then, that the meeting of the 5th of November, um, we will likely be briefed by the department on the policy proposals for the gambling bill, and also the committee will commence formal clause by clause scrutiny of the pension schemes bill. Members, any comments on that? Are happy enough with that too? Yes, in the room. Andy, happy enough with agenda item 10? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, that's great. And then I'm going to then, um, I don't know if Mark's still with us or not, he's showing up that he's still here, but um, I don't know whether he's there or not, he'll come in if he is. Um, I'm then going to move on to agenda item 11, which is AOB. Members, any other relevant business? Brad? Sure, I, I forgot to raise it uh, when uh, the, the, the guys weren't from uh, the IFA. Uh, I, I thought for, um, it was a shock to me this morning, that there was a working relationship between Belfast City Council FM in terms of uh, yeah. the Magic. leisure centre in, 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 in Butcher Road, Olympia, yeah. um, and uh, it's a new modern facility uh, there. And, and, uh, so I don't know. I, know. Mm -hmm. I actually forgot to ask that. Okay. Hey, what was the question? Sorry for that. Uh, there was a working relationship between the uh, uh, Windsor and the uh, Olympia Leisure Centre, which are next door to each other, and it's a new modern facility there. And so. I, I don't know what uh, if, if it was what happened. Or, or, uh, I mean, there seems to be ample um, facilities within uh, that, uh, certainly for uh, the, the, the cater for any, any of their needs. Okay, so are, are they using then Olympia as well as...? Well, I said they were talking to councils. Okay. And well, I know councils certainly to do with any football matches, councils would yeah. be involved with that, but... I, th I think probably that's in relation to the point that I maybe raised about third-party organisations. What, what, I, what I meant by that, Chair, and through to far, was that um, in part of the sub regional study funding, it talks about a uh, regional training centre um, as part of that. Um, in the presentation, and I think Sinead mentioned this, they talked about that they wouldn't be partnering essentially with clubs for that. It was looking at third party organisations, such as other councils. I know my own has done that, and I'm sure others has as well, about how that would be funded and where that would actually take place. So. Yeah, I, I asked probably what he meant in terms of his conversation with Belfast City Council. That's happened yeah. latterly, but I know other councils yeah. are, are interested in that project. Okay. okay so is that okay, Fred? Okay. Is there any further you need of that? No, it's not fine. Okay. Robin, have you any other business? Yeah, sure. Just further to that point. Uh, obviously, the new Avonil, whatever it's called, which is a site for soccer excellence, uh, as I understand it, or certainly a dedicated site for football in general. And we might want to inquire what the relationship between the IFA and Belfast City Council is, reference that site. It's okay. currently under construction. All right, we'll do that. We'll put a letter forward on that. Um, Andy, have you any AOB you want, or any other business you want to bring up? No, no, Um or actually, Chair, um, j just on the, um, I don't know if other members are the same, and, uh, and I'm obviously here to um, bring up sort of constituency matters, but I've been receiving a lot of correspondence from DJs um, who are highlighting that they're, they're faced a bit of difficulty being able to apply for funding on their 
the arts. Um, now I've written to the minister as, in my capacity as an MLA, but it's just if, if we can, as a committee, seek clarification in respect to that in terms of the wider arts funding. Okay. Yep. I think um, I know as as MLAs, all of us have been contacted by various people within the arts um, that, that yeah. don't or don't feel or, or don't know if they're going to be included and in, in part of the next funding round. So I suppose that's why we need to have that detailed, yeah. um, it, it's sort of list and detailed um, of, of what way the, the, the funding is going to be allocated and how people apply for it and everything else. So I think that's part of the, the great, the bigger mix there, but certainly um, we can ask that as well. So we can. Okay, Andy? I think, I think the, the specific query from the DJs was in relation to the individual fund, um, which uh, I think the Minister did put some stuff out into the public domain. Okay. In respect to that, I, I certainly seen a press release come out um, around $3 million for uh, funding to support the a waiting list uh, of applicants. So I think it was more specifically in relation to that fund, but okay. it'd be helpful to get that, that other information that you've outlined, Chair, as to the broad range of criteria and different funds that are obviously going to come forward. Okay, and now that you say that, I do remember actually saying that statement and saying tweets by the Minister as well that DJs were included in that. So yeah, I actually remember that now that you say that. Um, okay, Johnny, did you have something under yeah. AOB? Yeah, and it's just, it's probably my last ever chance to get under AOB, so I may as well bring it up. But uh, Andy, I know, has, has been mentioning this conti or continuously throughout my time in the committee, and I know I have as well. Um, but the need for the Charities Commission to come before the committee to brief them at the earliest possibility. Uh, you know, there's, there was concerns even recently, a, a recent report regarding the treatment of uh, a, 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 a charity and, and one of those um, local charity commissioners. So I, I think that's important that the committee uh, have that presentation by the Charities Commission as soon as possible because there, there's serious issues that I think it's in the public interest for this committee to scrutinise. Okay, yep, we will go and ask again. Yep, Andy, go ahead. Sure, just on that point, and again, can I de declare another interest as a charity trustee, but just further to what Johnny's saying there, um, can we also just seek uh, an update from the department in respect to that, that wider working on? Um, obviously, there was the, the Court of Appeal uh, stuff that uh, the minister had advised the committee she was working on, so if we could uh, seek an update as to where things currently sit with the department around the, the charity stuff. Yeah, it's my understanding that we have as a committee asked for briefings on this and we have been the Department of Quebec to say that they're not ready to brief us yet because there's certain things that they're still doing. Um, so I think we will. We'll certainly go back and ask again and ask for those details as well that you and jo Andy and Johnny have, have highlighted there. Okay, members, any other business? Mark, have you anything you need to bring up? No, I'm fine, Chair. Sure, thank you. Okay, Grant. All right, then, members, we'll move on to agenda item 12, which is date, time, and location of our next meeting. Can I advise you the next meeting will take place here in room 29 on Thursday, the 5th of November at 10 a.m.? Okay, thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly 